Counterev Audio. April 2021. Democracy, the God that Failed. The Economics and Politics of Monarchy, Democracy, and Natural Order. Hans Hermann Hoppe. Published in 2001 by Transaction Publishers, New Brunswick, New Jersey. Every form of government welfare, the compulsory wealth or income transfer from haves to have nots lowers the value of a person's membership in an extended family household system as a social system of mutual cooperation and help and assistance. Marriage loses value. For parents the value and importance of a good upbringing education of their own children is reduced. Correspondingly, for children less value will be attached and less respect paid to their own parents. Owing to the high concentration of welfare recipients in the big cities family disintegration is already well advanced. In appealing to gender and generation age as a source of political support and promoting and enacting sex, gender and family legislation invariably the authority of heads of families and households and the natural intergenerational hierarchy within families is weakened and the value of a multi-generational family as the basic unit of human society diminished. Indeed, as should be clear, as soon as the government's law and legislation supersedes family law and legislation, including inter-family arrangements in conjunction with marriages, joint family offspring, inheritance, etc., the value and importance of the institution of a family can only be systematically eroded. For what is a family if it cannot even find and provide for its own internal law and order? At the same time, as should be clear as well but has not been sufficiently noted, from the point of view of the government's rulers, their ability to interfere in internal family matters must be regarded as the ultimate prize and the pinnacle of their own power. To exploit tribal or racial resentments or class envy to one's personal advantage is one thing. It is quite another accomplishment to use the quarrels arising within families to break up the entire, generally harmonious, system of autonomous families, to uproot individuals from their families to isolate and atomize them, thereby increasing the state's power over them. Accordingly, as the government's family policy is implemented, divorce, singledom, single parenting, and illegitimacy, incidents of parent, spouse, and child neglect or abuse, and the variety and frequency of non-traditional lifestyles, homosexuality, lesbianism, communism, and occultism increase as well. Parallel to this development will be a gradual but steady surge in crime and criminal behavior. Under monopolistic auspices, law will invariably be transformed into legislation. As a result of an unending process of income and wealth redistribution in the name of racial, social, and or gender justice, the very idea of justice as universal and immutable principles of conduct and cooperation will be eroded and ultimately destroyed. Rather than being conceived of as something pre-existing and to be discovered, law is increasingly considered as government-made law, legislation. Accordingly, not only will legal uncertainty increase, but in reaction the social rate of time preference will rise, i.e., people in general will become more present-oriented and have an increasingly shorter planning horizon. Moral relativism will also be promoted. For if there is no such thing as an ultimate right, then there is also no such thing as an absolute wrong. Indeed, what is right today may be wrong tomorrow, and vice versa. Rising time preferences combined with moral relativism, then, provides the perfect breeding ground for criminals and crimes, a tendency especially evident in the big cities. It is here that the dissolution of families is most advanced, that the greatest concentration of welfare recipients exists, that the process of genetic pauperization has progressed furthest, and that tribal and racial tensions as the outcome of forced integration are most virulent. Rather than centers of civilization, cities have become centers of social disintegration and cesspools of physical and moral decay, corruption, brutishness, and crime. IV. What follows from all of this? Clearly, Western civilization has been on a course of self-destruction for quite some time. Can this course be stopped, and if so, how? I wish I could be optimistic, but I am not so sure that there is sufficient reason for optimism. To be sure, history is ultimately determined by ideas, and ideas can, at least in principle, change almost instantly. But in order for ideas to change it is not sufficient for people to see that something is wrong. At least a significant number must also be intelligent enough to recognize what it is that is wrong. That is, they must understand the basic principles upon which society, human cooperation, rests, the very principles explained here and they must have sufficient willpower to act according to this insight. But it is precisely this which one must increasingly doubt. 
civilization and culture do have a genetic, biological basis. However, as the result of statism, of forced integration, egalitarianism, welfare policies, and family destruction, the genetic quality of the population has most certainly declined. Indeed, how could it not when success is systematically punished and failure rewarded? Whether intended or not, the welfare state promotes the proliferation of intellectually and morally inferior people and the results would be even worse were it not for the fact that crime rates are particularly high among these people and that they tend to eliminate each other more frequently. However, even if all of this does not give much hope for the future, all is not lost. There still remain some pockets of civilization and culture. Not in the cities and metropolitan areas, but in the heartland, countryside. In order to preserve these, several requirements must be fulfilled. The state, the judicial, monopoly must be recognized as the source of decivilization. States do not create law and order, they destroy it. Families and households must be recognized as the source of civilization. It is essential that the heads of families and households reassert their ultimate authority as judge in all internal family affairs. Households must be declared extraterritorial territory, like foreign embassies. Voluntary spatial segregation and discrimination must be recognized as not bad but good things that facilitate peaceful cooperation between different ethnic and racial groups. Welfare must be recognized as a matter exclusively of families and voluntary charity and state welfare as nothing but the subsidization of irresponsibility. 10. On conservatism and libertarianism. I. Let me begin by discussing two possible meanings of the term conservative. The first meaning is to refer to someone as conservative who generally supports the status quo, that is, a person who wants to conserve whatever laws, rules, regulations, moral and behavioral codes happen to exist at any given point in time. Because different laws, rules and political institutions are in place at different times and or different locations, what a conservative supports depends on and changes with place and time. To be a conservative means nothing specific at all except to like the existing order, whatever that may be. The first meaning can be discarded, then. The term conservative must have a different meaning. What it means, and possibly only can mean, is this, conservative refers to someone who believes in the existence of a natural order, a natural state of affairs which corresponds to the nature of things, of nature, and man. This natural order is and can be disturbed by accidents and anomalies, by earthquakes and hurricanes, diseases, pests, monsters and beasts, by two-headed horses or four-legged humans, cripples and idiots, and by war, conquest and tyranny. But it is not difficult to distinguish the normal from the anomaly, the essential from the accidental. A little bit of abstraction removes all the clutter and enables nearly everyone to see what is and what is not natural and in accordance with the nature of things. Moreover, the natural is at the same time the most enduring state of affairs. The natural order is ancient and forever the same, only anomalies and accidents undergo change, hence it can be recognized by us everywhere and at all times. Conservative refers to someone who recognizes the old and natural through the noise of anomalies and accidents and who defends, supports, and helps to preserve it against the temporary and anomalous. Within the realm of the humanities, including the social sciences, a conservative recognizes families, fathers, mothers, children, grandchildren, and households based on private property and in cooperation with a community of other households as the most fundamental, natural, essential, ancient, and indispensable social units. Moreover, the family household also represents the model of the social order at large. Just as a hierarchical order exists in a family, so is there a hierarchical order within a community of families, of apprentices, servants, and masters, vassals, knights, lords, overlords, and even kings, tied together by an elaborate and intricate system of kinship relations, and of children, parents, priests, bishops, cardinals, patriarchs or popes, and finally the transcendent God. Of the two layers of authority, the earthly physical power of parents, lords, and kings is naturally subordinate and subject to control by the ultimate spiritual intellectual authority of fathers, priests, bishops, and ultimately God. Conservatives, or more specifically, Western Greco-Christian conservatives, if they stand for anything, stand for and want to preserve the family and the social hierarchies and layers of material as well as spiritual intellectual authority based on and growing out of family bonds and kinship relations. Aye, aye. Let me now come to an evaluation of contemporary conservatism and then go on to explain why conservatives today must be antistatist libertarians and, equally important, why libertarians must be conservatives. 
modern conservatism in the United States and Europe is confused and distorted. This confusion is largely due to democracy. Under the influence of representative democracy and with the transformation of the US and Europe into mass democracies from World War I, conservatism was transformed from an anti-egalitarian, aristocratic, anti-statist ideological force into a movement of culturally conservative statists, the right wing of the socialists and social democrats. Most self-proclaimed contemporary conservatives are concerned, as they should be, about the decay of families, divorce, illegitimacy, loss of authority, multiculturalism, alternative lifestyles, social disintegration, sex, and crime. All of these phenomena represent anomalies and scandalous deviations from the natural order. A conservative must indeed be opposed to all of these developments and try to restore normalcy. However, most contemporary conservatives, at least most of the spokesmen of the conservative establishment, either do not recognize that their goal of restoring normalcy requires the most drastic, even revolutionary, anti-statist social changes, or, if they know about this, they are members of the fifth column engaged in destroying conservatism from inside, and hence, must be regarded as evil. That this is largely true for the so-called neoconservatives does not require further explanation here. Indeed, as far as their leaders are concerned, one suspects that most of them are of the latter, evil, kind. They are not truly concerned about cultural matters but recognize that they must play the cultural conservatism card so as not to lose power and promote their entirely different goal of global social democracy. However, it is also true of many conservatives who are genuinely concerned about family disintegration or dysfunction and cultural rot. I am thinking here in particular of the conservatism represented by Patrick Buchanan and his movement. Buchanan's conservatism is by no means as different from that of the conservative Republican Party establishment as he and his followers fancy themselves. In one decisive respect their brand of conservatism is in full agreement with that of the conservative establishment, both are statists. They differ over what exactly needs to be done to restore normalcy to the US, but they agree that it must be done by the state. There is not a trace of principled antistatism in either. Let me illustrate by quoting Samuel Francis, one of the leading theoreticians and strategists of the Buchananite movement. After deploring anti-white and anti-Western propaganda, militant secularism, acquisitive egoism, economic and political globalism, demographic inundation, and unchecked state centralism, he expounds on a new spirit of America first, which implies not only putting national interests over those of other nations and abstractions like world leadership, global harmony, and the new world order, but also giving priority to the nation over the gratification of individual and subnational interests. So far so good. But how does he propose to fix the problem of moral degeneration and cultural rot? Those parts of the federal leviathan responsible for the proliferation of moral and cultural pollution such as the Department of Education, the National Endowment of the Arts, the Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, and the federal judiciary should be closed or cut down to size. But there is no opposition against the state's involvement in educational matters. There is no recognition that the natural order in education means that the state has nothing to do with it. Education is entirely a family matter. Moreover, there is no recognition that moral degeneracy and cultural rot of deeper causes and cannot simply be cured by state-imposed curriculum changes or exhortations and declamations. To the contrary, Francis proposes that the cultural turnaround, the restoration of normalcy, can be achieved without a fundamental change in the structure of the modern welfare state. Indeed, Buchanan and his ideologues explicitly defend the three core institutions of the welfare state, social security, Medicare, and unemployment subsidies. They even want to expand the social responsibilities of the state by assigning to it the task of protecting, by means of national import and export restrictions, American jobs, especially in industries of national concern, and insulate the wages of U.S. workers from foreign laborers who must work for $1 an hour or less. In fact, Buchananites freely admit that they are statists. They detest and ridicule capitalism, laissez-faire, free markets and trade, wealth, elites, and nobility, and they advocate a new populist, indeed proletarian, conservatism which amalgamates social and cultural conservatism and social or socialist economics. Thus, continues Francis, while the left could win middle Americans through its economic measures, it lost them through its social and cultural radicalism, and while the right could attract middle Americans through appeals to law and order and defense of sexual normality, conventional morals and religion, traditional social institutions and invocations of nationalism and patriotism, 
it lost middle Americans when it rehearsed its old bourgeois economic formulas. Hence, it is necessary to combine the economic policies of the left and the nationalism and cultural conservatism of the right to create a new identity synthesizing both the economic interests and cultural national loyalties of the proletarianized middle class in a separate and unified political movement. For obvious reasons this doctrine is not so named, but there is a term for this type of conservatism, it is called social nationalism or national socialism. I will not concern myself here with the question whether or not Buchanan's conservatism has mass appeal and whether or not its diagnosis of American politics is sociologically correct. I doubt that this is the case, and certainly Buchanan's fate during the 1995 and 2000 Republican presidential primaries does not indicate otherwise. Rather, I want to address the more fundamental questions, assuming that it does have such appeal, that is, assuming that cultural conservatism and social socialist economics can be psychologically combined, that is, that people can hold both of these views simultaneously without cognitive dissonance, can they also be effectively and practically, economically and praxeologically, combined? Is it possible to maintain the current level of economic socialism, social security, etc., and reach the goal of restoring cultural normalcy, natural families and normal rules of conduct? Buchanan and his theoreticians do not feel the need to raise this question because they believe politics to be solely a matter of will and power. They do not believe in such things as economic laws. If only people want something and they are given the power to implement their will, everything can be achieved. The dead Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises, to whom Buchanan referred contemptuously during his campaign, characterized this belief as historicism, the intellectual posture of the German Catholic Socialisten, the academic socialists of the chair, who justified any and all statist measures. But historicist contempt and ignorance of economics does not alter the fact that inexorable economic laws exist. You cannot have your cake and eat it too, for instance. Or what you consume now cannot be consumed again in the future. Or producing more of one good requires producing less of another. No wishful thinking can make such laws go away. To believe otherwise can only result in practical failure. In fact, noted Mises, economic history is a long record of government policies that failed because they were designed with a bold disregard for the laws of economics. In light of elementary and immutable economic laws, the Buchananite program of social nationalism is just another bold but impossible dream. No wishful thinking can alter the fact that maintaining the core institutions of the present welfare state and wanting to return to traditional families, norms, conduct, and culture are incompatible goals. You can have one, socialism, welfare, or the other, traditional morals, but you cannot have both, for social nationalist economics, the pillar of the current welfare state system Buchanan wants to leave untouched, is the very cause of cultural and social anomalies. In order to clarify this, it is only necessary to recall one of the most fundamental laws of economics which says that all compulsory wealth or income redistribution, regardless of the criteria on which it is based, involves taking from some, the havers of something, and giving it to others, the non-havers of something. Accordingly, the incentive to be a haver is reduced, and the incentive to be a non-haver increased. What the haver has is characteristically something considered good, and what the non-haver does not have is something bad or a deficiency. Indeed, this is the very idea underlying any redistribution, some have too much good stuff and others not enough. The result of every redistribution is that one will thereby produce less good and increasingly more bad, less perfection and more deficiencies. By subsidizing with tax funds, with funds taken from others, people who are poor, bad, more poverty will be created. By subsidizing people because they are unemployed, bad, more unemployment will be created. By subsidizing unwed mothers, bad, there will be more unwed mothers and more illegitimate births, etc. Obviously, this basic insight applies to the entire system of so-called social security that has been implemented in Western Europe from the 1880s onward and the US since the 1930s of compulsory government insurance against old age, illness, occupational injury, unemployment, indigence, etc. In conjunction with the even older compulsory system of public education, these institutions and practices amount to a massive attack on the institution of the family and personal responsibility. By relieving individuals of the obligation to provide for their own income, health, safety, old age, and children's education, the range and temporal horizon of private provision is reduced and the value of marriage, family, children, and kinship relations is lowered. 
irresponsibility, short-sightedness, negligence, illness and even destructionism, bads are promoted, and responsibility, far-sightedness, diligence, health and conservatism, goods are punished. The compulsory old age insurance system in particular, by which retirees, the old, are subsidized from taxes imposed on current income earners, the young, has systematically weakened the natural intergenerational bond between parents, grandparents, and children. The old need no longer rely on the assistance of their children if they have made no provision for their own old age, and the young, with typically less accumulated wealth, must support the old, with typically more accumulated wealth, rather than the other way around, as is typical within families. Consequently, not only do people want to have fewer children, and indeed, birth rates have fallen in half since the onset of modern social security, welfare policies, but also the respect which the young traditionally accorded to their elders is diminished, and all indicators of family disintegration and malfunctioning, such as rates of divorce, illegitimacy, child abuse, parent abuse, spouse abuse, single parenting, singledom, alternative lifestyles, and abortion, have increased. Moreover, with the socialization of the healthcare system through institutions such as Medicaid and Medicare and the regulation of the insurance industry, by restricting an insurer's right of refusal to exclude any individual risk as an insurable and discriminate freely, according to actuarial methods, between different group risks, a monstrous machinery of wealth and income redistribution at the expense of responsible individuals and low-risk groups in favor of irresponsible actors and high. Risk groups has been put in motion. Subsidies for the ill, unhealthy and disabled breed illness, disease, and disability and weaken the desire to work for a living and to lead healthy lives. One can do no better than quote the dead Austrian economist Ludwig von Mises once more. Being ill is not a phenomenon independent of conscious will. A man's efficiency is not merely a result of his physical condition, it depends largely on his mind and will. The destructionist aspect of accident and health insurance lies above all in the fact that such institutions promote accident and illness, hinder recovery, and very often create, or at any rate intensify and lengthen, the functional disorders which follow illness or accident. To feel healthy is quite different from being healthy in the medical sense. By weakening or completely destroying the will to be well and able to work, social insurance creates illness and inability to work, it produces the habit of complaining, which is in itself a neurosis and neuroses of other kinds as a social institution it makes a people sick bodily and mentally or at least helps to multiply, lengthen, and intensify disease. Social insurance has thus made the neurosis of the insured a dangerous public disease. Should the institution be extended and developed the disease will spread. No reform can be of any assistance. We cannot weaken or destroy the will to health without producing illness. I do not wish to explain here the economic nonsense of Buchanan's and his theoreticians' even further-reaching idea of protectionist policies of protecting American wages. If they were right, their argument in favor of economic protection would amount to an indictment of all trade and a defense of the thesis that everyone, each family, would be better off if he had never traded with anyone else. Certainly, in this case no one could ever lose his job, and unemployment due to unfair competition would be reduced to zero. Yet such a full employment society would not be prosperous and strong, it would be composed of people, families, who, despite working from dawn to dusk, would be condemned to poverty and starvation. Buchanan's international protectionism, while less destructive than a policy of interpersonal or interregional protectionism, would result in precisely the same effect. This is not conservatism, conservatives want families to be prosperous and strong. This is economic destructionism. In any case, what should be clear by now is that most if not all of the moral degeneration and cultural rot, the signs of decivilization, all around us are the inescapable and unavoidable results of the welfare state and its core institutions. Classical, old-style conservatives knew this, and they vigorously opposed public education and social security. They knew that states everywhere were intent upon breaking down and ultimately destroying families and the institutions and layers and hierarchies of authority that are the natural outgrowth of family-based communities in order to increase and strengthen their own power. They knew that in order to do so states would have to take advantage of the natural rebellion of the adolescent, juvenile, against parental authority. And they knew that socialized education and socialized responsibility were the means of bringing about this goal. Social education and social security provide an opening for the rebellious youth to escape parental authority to get away with continuous misbehavior. 
Old conservatives knew that these policies would emancipate the individual from the discipline imposed by family and community life only to subject it instead to the direct and immediate control of the state. Furthermore, they knew, or at least had a hunch, that this would lead to a systematic infantilization of society, a regression, emotionally and mentally, from adulthood to adolescence or childhood. In contrast, Buchanan's populist proletarian conservatism, social nationalism, shows complete ignorance of all of this. Combining cultural conservatism and welfare statism is impossible, and hence, economic nonsense. Welfare statism, social security in any way, shape or form, breeds moral and cultural rot and degeneration. Thus, if one is indeed concerned about America's moral decay and wants to restore normalcy to society and culture, one must oppose all aspects of the modern social welfare state. A return to normalcy requires no less than the complete elimination of the present social security system of unemployment insurance, social security, Medicare, Medicaid, public education, etc., and thus the near-complete dissolution and deconstruction of the current state apparatus and government power. If one is ever to restore normalcy, government funds and power must dwindle to or even fall below their 19th century levels. Hence, true conservatives must be hardline libertarians and to statists. Buchanan's conservatism is false, it wants a return to traditional morality but at the same time advocates keeping the very institutions in place that are responsible for the perversion and destruction of traditional morals. Ill. Most contemporary conservatives, then, especially among the media darlings, are not conservatives but socialists, either of the internationalist sort, the new and neoconservative warfare welfare statists and global social democrats or of the nationalist variety, the Buchananite populists. Genuine conservatives must be opposed to both. In order to restore social and cultural normalcy, true conservatives can only be radical libertarians and they must demand the demolition as a moral and economic perversion of the entire structure of social security. If conservatives must be libertarians, why must libertarians be conservatives? If conservatives must learn from libertarians, must libertarians also learn from conservatives? First, a few terminological clarifications are in order. The term libertarianism, as employed here, is a 20th century phenomenon, or more accurately, a post-World War I phenomenon, with intellectual roots in both classical, 18th and 19th century, liberalism and even older natural law philosophy. It is a product of modern, enlightenment, rationalism. Culminating in the work of Marianne Rothbard, the fountainhead of the modern libertarian movement, and in particular his ethics of liberty, libertarianism is a rational system of ethics, law. Working within the tradition of classical political philosophy of Hobbes, Grotius, Pufendorf, Locke, and Spencer, and employing the same ancient analytical, conceptual tools and logical apparatus as they do, libertarianism, Rothbardianism, is a systematic law code, derived by means of logical deduction from a single principle, the validity of which, and this is what makes it an ultimate principle, i.e., an ethical axiom, and the libertarian law code an axiomatic deductive theory of justice cannot be disputed without falling prey to logical practical, praxeological, or performative contradictions, that is, without implicitly affirming what one explicitly denies. This axiom is the ancient principle of original appropriation, ownership of scarce resources, the right of an exclusive control over scarce resources, private property, is acquired through an act of original appropriation, by which resources are taken out of a state of nature and put into a state of civilization. If this were not so, no one could ever begin to act, do or propose anything, hence, any other principle is praxeologically impossible and argumentatively indefensible. From the principle of original appropriation, the first use first own principle rules concerning the transformation and the transfer, exchange, of originally appropriated resources are derived, and all of ethics, law, including the principles of punishment, is then reconstructed in terms of a theory of property rights, all human rights are property rights, and all human rights violations are property rights violations. The upshot of this libertarian theory of justice is well known in these circles, the state, according to the most influential strand of libertarian theory, the Rothbardian one, is an outlaw organization, and the only social order that is just is a system of private property anarchy. I do not want to further analyze or defend the libertarian theory of justice at this point. Let me only confess that I believe the theory to be true, indeed to be irrefutably true. Rather, I want to turn to the question of the relationship between libertarianism and conservatism, the belief in a natural social order based and centered on families. 
Some superficial commentators, mostly from the conservative side, such as Russell Kirk, have characterized libertarianism and conservatism as incompatible, hostile, or even antagonistic ideologies. In fact, this view is entirely mistaken. The relationship between libertarianism and conservatism is one of praxeological compatibility, sociological complementarity, and reciprocal reinforcement. In order to explain this, let me first point out that most, though not all, leading libertarian thinkers were, as a matter of empirical fact, social-cultural conservatives, defenders of traditional, bourgeois morals and manners. Most notably, Murray Rothbard, the single most important and influential libertarian thinker, was an outspoken cultural conservative. So was Rothbard's most important teacher, Ludwig von Mises. Ayn Rand, another major influence on contemporary libertarianism, is a different matter, of course. While this does not prove much, it does prove only that libertarianism and conservatism can be psychologically reconciled, it is indicative of a substantive affinity between the two doctrines. It is not difficult to recognize that the conservative and the libertarian views of society are perfectly compatible, congruent. To be sure, their methods are distinctly different. One is, or appears to be, empiristic, sociological, and descriptive, and the other rationalistic, philosophical, logical, and constructivist. This difference notwithstanding, both agree in one fundamental respect, however. Conservatives are convinced that the natural and normal is old and widespread and thus can be discerned always and everywhere. Similarly, libertarians are convinced that the principles of justice are eternally and universally valid and hence must have been essentially known to mankind since its very beginnings. That is, the libertarian ethic is not new and revolutionary but old and conservative. Even primitives and children are capable of grasping the validity of the principle of original appropriation, and most people usually recognize it as an unquestionable matter of fact. Moreover, as far as the object on which conservatives and libertarians focus is concerned, on the one hand families, kinship relations, communities, authority and social hierarchy, and on the other hand property and its appropriation, transformation and transfer, it should be clear that while they do not refer to identical entities, they still speak about different aspects of one and the same object, human actors and social cooperation. Extensively, that is, their realm of inquiry frame of reference is identical. Families, authority, communities, and social ranks are the empirical sociological concretization of the abstract philosophical praxeological categories and concepts of property, production, exchange, and contract. Property and property relations do not exist apart from families and kinship relations. The latter shape and determine the specific form and configuration of property and property relations while they are at the same time constrained by the universal and eternal laws of scarcity and property. In fact, as we have already seen, families considered normal by conservative standards are household families and the family disintegration and moral and cultural decay which contemporary conservatives deplore is largely the result of the erosion and destruction of households, estates, as the economic basis of families by the modern welfare state. Thus, the libertarian theory of justice can actually provide conservatism with a more precise definition and a more rigorous moral defense of its own end, the return to civilization in the form of moral and cultural normalcy than conservatism itself could ever offer. In doing so it can further sharpen and strengthen conservatism's traditional antistatist outlook. IV. While the intellectual creators of modern libertarianism were cultural conservatives, and while the libertarian doctrine is fully compatible and congruent with the conservative worldview and does not, as some conservative critics claim, entail an atomistic individualism and acquisitive egoism corrupted by the modern welfare state the libertarian movement has undergone a significant transformation. To a large extent, and completely so in the eyes of the media and the public, it has become a movement that combines radical antistatism and market economics with cultural leftism, counter- and multiculturalism, and personal hedonism, that is, it is the exact opposite of the Buchananite program of culturally conservative socialism, countercultural capitalism. Earlier it was noted that the Buchananite program of socialist nationalism does not seem to have much mass appeal, at least not in the United States. This is true to an even larger extent for the libertarian attempt to synthesize market economics with counter- and multiculturalism. Yet as was the case with conservatism before, in this case, too, my central concern is not about mass appeal and whether or not certain ideas can be psychologically combined and integrated, but whether or not these ideas can be combined practically and effectively. 
It is my plan to show that they cannot, and that much of contemporary libertarianism is false, counterproductive libertarianism, much like Buchanan's conservatism is false and counterproductive. That much of modern libertarianism is culturally leftist is not due to any such leanings among the major libertarian theoreticians. As noted, they were for the most part cultural conservatives. Rather, it was the result of a superficial understanding of the libertarian doctrine by many of its fans and followers, and this ignorance has its explanation in a historical coincidence and a mentioned tendency, inherent in the social democratic welfare state, of promoting a process of intellectual and emotional infantilization, decivilization of society. The beginnings of the modern libertarian movement in the United States go back to the mid-1960s. In 1971 the Libertarian Party was founded, and in 1972 the philosopher John Hospers was nominated as its first presidential candidate. It was the time of the Vietnam War. Simultaneously, promoted by the major advances in the growth of the welfare state from the early and mid-1960s onward in the United States and similarly in Western Europe, the so-called civil rights legislation and the war on poverty, a new mass phenomenon emerged. A new lumpen proletariat of intellectuals and intellectualized youths, the products of an ever-expanding system of socialist, public, education, alienated from mainstream, bourgeois morals and culture, while living far more comfortably than the lumpen proletariat of old off the wealth created by this mainstream culture, arose. Multiculturalism and cultural relativism, live and let live, and egalitarian anti-authoritarianism, respect no authority, were elevated from temporary and transitory phases in mental development, adolescence, to permanent attitudes among grown-up intellectuals and their students. The principled opposition of the libertarians to the Vietnam War coincided with the somewhat diffuse opposition to the war by the new left. In addition, the anarchistic upshot of the libertarian doctrine appealed to the countercultural left. For did not the illegitimacy of the state and the non-aggression axiom that one shall not initiate or threaten to initiate physical force against others and their property imply that everyone was at liberty to choose his very own non-aggressive lifestyle? Did this not imply that vulgarity, obscenity, profanity, drug use, promiscuity, pornography, prostitution, homosexuality, polygamy, pedophilia or any other conceivable perversity or abnormality, insofar as they were victimless crimes, were no offences at all but perfectly normal and legitimate activities and lifestyles? Not surprisingly, then, from the outset the libertarian movement attracted an unusually high number of abnormal and perverse followers. Subsequently, the countercultural ambience and multicultural relativistic tolerance of the libertarian movement attracted even greater numbers of misfits, personal or professional failures, or plain losers. Murray Rothbard, in disgust, called them the Nihila libertarians and identified them as the modal, typical, and representative libertarians. They fantasized of a society where everyone would be free to choose and cultivate whatever non-aggressive lifestyle, career, or character he wanted, and where, as a result of free market economics, everyone could do so on an elevated level of general prosperity. Ironically, the movement that had set out to dismantle the state and restore private property and market economics was largely appropriated and its appearance shaped by the mental and emotional products of the welfare state, the new class of permanent adolescents. Writing nearly a decade later, Rothbard acknowledged a twofold strategic error in his erstwhile attempt to forge an alliance between libertarians and the new left. A. Gravely overestimating the emotional stability and the knowledge of economics of these fledgling libertarians and, as a corollary, B. Gravely underestimating the significance of the fact that these libertarian cadre were weak and isolated, that there was no libertarian movement to speak of, and therefore that hurling these youngsters into an alliance with a far more numerous and powerful group was bound to lead to a high incidence of defection into real leftism of the left-wing. Anarchist Maoist Syndicalist Variety Toward a Strategy of Libertarian Social Change, Unpublished Manuscript, 1977, pp 159,160-61. Marianne Rothbard has given the following portrait of the modal libertarian ML. ML is indeed a he. The ML was in his twenties twenty years ago and is now in his forties. That is neither as banal or as benign as it sounds because it means that the movement has not really grown in twenty years. The ML is fairly bright and fairly well steeped in libertarian theory. But he knows nothing and cares less about history, culture, the context of reality or world affairs. His only reading or cultural knowledge is science fiction. The ML does not, unfortunately, hate the state because he sees it as the unique social instrument of organized aggression against person and property. 
Instead, the ML is an adolescent rebel against everyone around him, first, against his parents, second against his family, third against his neighbors, and finally against society itself. He is especially opposed to institutions of social and cultural authority, in particular against the bourgeoisie from whom he stemmed, against bourgeois norms and conventions, and against such institutions of social authority as churches. To the ML, then, the state is not a unique problem, it is only the most visible and odious of many hated bourgeois institutions, hence the zest with which the ML sports the button, question authority. And hence, too, the fanatical hostility of the ML toward Christianity. I used to think that this militant atheism was merely a function of the Randianism out of which most modern libertarians emerged two decades ago. But atheism is not the key, for let someone in a libertarian gathering announce that he or she is a witch or a worshipper of crystal power or some other new age hokum, and that person will be treated with great tolerance and respect. It is only Christians that are subject to abuse, and clearly the reason for the difference in treatment has nothing to do with atheism. But it has everything to do with rejecting and spurning bourgeois American culture, and any kind of kooky cultural cause will be encouraged in order to tweak the noses of the hated bourgeoisie. In point of fact, the original attraction of the ML to Randianism was part and parcel of his adolescent rebellion, what better way to rationalize and systematize rejection of one's parents, family, and neighbors than to join a cult which denounces religion and which trumpets the absolute superiority of yourself and your cult leaders as contrasted to the robotic second-handers who supposedly people the bourgeois world. A cult, furthermore, which calls upon you to spum your parents, family, and bourgeois associates, and to cultivate the alleged greatness of your own individual ego, suitably guided, of course, by Randian leadership, the ML, if he has a real-world occupation, such as an accountant or lawyer, is generally a lawyer without a practice and accountant without a job. The ML's modal occupation is computer programmer. Computers appeal indeed to the ML's scientific and theoretical bent, but they also appeal to his aggravated nomadism, to his need not to have a regular payroll or regular abode the ML also has the thousand-mile stare of the fanatic. He is apt to buttonhole you at the first opportunity and go on at great length about his own particular great discovery about his mighty manuscript which is crying out for publication if only it. This intellectual combination could hardly end happily. Private property capitalism and egalitarian multiculturalism are as unlikely a combination as socialism and cultural conservatism. And in trying to combine what cannot be combined, much of the modern libertarian movement actually contributed to the further erosion of private property rights, just as much of contemporary conservatism contributed to the erosion of families and traditional morals. What the countercultural libertarians failed to recognize, and what true libertarians cannot emphasize enough, is that the restoration of private property rights and laissez-faire economics implies a sharp and drastic increase in social discrimination and will swiftly eliminate most if not all of the multicultural egalitarian lifestyle experiments so close to the heart of left libertarians. In other words, libertarians must be radical and uncompromising conservatives. Contrary to the left libertarians assembled around such institutions as the Cato Institute and the Institute for Justice, for instance, who seek the assistance of the central government in the enforcement of various policies of non-discrimination and call for a non-discriminatory or free immigration policy, true libertarians must embrace discrimination, be it internal, domestic, or external, foreign. Indeed, private property means discrimination. I, not you, own such and such. I am entitled to exclude you from my property. I may attach conditions to your using my property, and I may expel you from my property. Moreover, you and I, private property owners, may enter and put our property into a restrictive or protective covenant. We and others may, if we both deem it beneficial, impose limitations on the future use that each of us is permitted to make with our property. Hadn't been suppressed by the powers that be but above all, the ML is a moocher, a bunko artist, and often an outright crook. His basic attitude toward other libertarians is your house is my house, in short, whether they articulate this philosophy or not, MLS, a libertarian communists, anyone with property is automatically expected to share it with the other members of his extended libertarian family. Why paleo? Rothbard Rockwell Report 1, Number 2, May 1994-5, also Iden, Diversity, Death, and Reason, Rothbard Rockwell Report 2, Number 5, May 1991. Also see Llewellyn H. Rockwell, Jr., The Case for Paleolibertarianism and Realignment on the Right, Burlingame, Caliph, Center for Libertarian Studies, 1990.
More specifically, left libertarians LLS, employ and promote the employment of the federal government and its courts to squash discriminatory and presumably anti-libertarian state and or local laws and regulations. They thus contribute, regardless of their intention, to the anti-libertarian end of strengthening the central state. Correspondingly, LLS typically look favorably upon Lincoln and the Union government because the Union victory over the secessionist Confederacy resulted in the abolition of slavery, but they failed to recognize that this way of achieving the libertarian goal of abolishing slavery must lead to a drastic increase in the power of the central, federal, government, and that the Union victory in the Southern War of Independence indeed marks one of the great leaps forward in the growth of the modern federal Leviathan and hence represents a profoundly anti-libertarian episode in American history. Further, while us criticize the current practice of affirmative action as a quota system, they do not reject the so-called civil rights legislation from which the present practice developed is entirely and fundamentally incompatible with the cornerstone of libertarian political philosophy, i.e., private property rights. To the contrary, LLS are very much concerned about civil rights, most prominently the right of gays and other alternative lifestylers not to be discriminated against in employment and housing. Accordingly, they look favorably on the U.S. Supreme Court decision in Brown v. Board of Education to outlaw segregation and the proto-socialist civil rights leader Martin Luther King. To be sure, as typically recognize the categorical difference between private and so-called public property, and at least in theory they admit that private property owners ought to have the right to discriminate regarding their own property as they please. But the LLS distinctly egalitarian concern for the lofty yet elusive idea of the progressive extension of dignity instead of property rights to women, to people of different religions and different races, David Boaz, p. 16, reference below, my emphasis, misleads them to accept the very principle of non-discrimination, even if it is only applied and restricted to public property and the public sector of the economy. Hence the LLS advocacy of a non-discriminatory or free immigration policy. Theoretically, LLS thereby commit the error of regarding public property as if it were either unowned land open to unrestricted universal homesteading, while in fact all public property has been financed by domestic taxpayers, or as if it were communal property open to every domestic citizen on an equal basis, while in fact some citizens have paid more taxes than others, and some, i.e., those whose salaries or subsidies were paid out of taxes, have paid no taxes at all. Worse, in accepting the principle of non-discrimination for the realm of public property, LLS in fact contribute to the further aggrandizement of state power and the diminution of private property rights, for in today's state-ridden world, the dividing line between private and public has become increasingly fuzzy. All private property borders on and is surrounded by public streets, virtually every business sells some of its products to some government agency or across state borders, and countless private firms and organizations, such as private universities, for instance, regularly receive government funding. Hence, as seen from the perspective of the agents of the state, there is practically nothing left that is genuinely private and thus does not fall under government purview. Based on this all-pervasive entanglement of the state and public property with private business and private property, and given the government's unique, coercive, bargaining power, it can be safely predicted that the policy of non-discrimination will not remain a principle merely of public policy for long, but will instead increasingly become a general and ultimately universal principle, extending to and encompassing everyone and everything, public and private. Characteristically, LLS are typically also proponents of Milton Friedman's school voucher proposal and are thus, it would seem, totally unaware that the implementation of the voucher plan would invariably lead to the expansion of government control from public schools to one including private schools and the destruction of whatever autonomous decision-making rights the latter schools presently still possess. The modern welfare state has largely stripped private property owners of the right to exclusion implied in the concept of private property. Discrimination is outlawed. Employers cannot hire whom they want. Landlords cannot rent to whom they want. Sellers cannot sell to whomever they wish. Buyers cannot buy from whomever they wish to buy. And groups of private property owners are not permitted to enter in whatever restrictive covenant they believe to be mutually beneficial. The state has thus robbed the people of much of their personal and physical protection. Not to be able to exclude others means not to be able to protect oneself. The result of this erosion of private property rights under the democratic welfare state is forced integration. Forced integration is ubiquitous. Americans must accept immigrants they do not want. 
Teachers cannot get rid of lousy or ill-behaved students, employers are stuck with poor or destructive employees, landlords are forced to live with bad renters, banks and insurance companies are not allowed to avoid bad risks, restaurants and bars must accommodate unwelcome customers, and private clubs and covenants are compelled to accept members and actions in violation of their very own rules and restrictions. Moreover, on public, i.e., government property in particular, forced integration has taken on a dangerous form of norm and lawlessness. To exclude other people from one's own property is the very means by which an owner can avoid bads from happening, events that will lower the value of one's property. In not being permitted to freely exclude the incidence of bads, ill-behaved, lazy, unreliable, rotten students, employees, customers will increase and property values will fall. In fact, forced integration, the result of all non-discrimination policies, breeds ill behavior and bad character. In civilized society, the ultimate price for ill behavior is expulsion, and all-around ill-behaved or rotten characters, even if they commit no criminal offense, will find themselves quickly expelled from everywhere and by everyone and become outcasts, physically removed from civilization. This is a stiff price to pay, hence, the frequency of such behavior is reduced. By contrast, if one is prevented from expelling others from one's property whenever their presence is deemed undesirable, ill behavior, misconduct, and outright rotten characters are encouraged, rendered less costly. Rather than being isolated and ultimately entirely removed from society, the bums in every conceivable area of incompetency, bumhood, are permitted to perpetrate their unpleasantries everywhere, so bum-like behavior and bums will proliferate. The results of forced integration are only too visible. All social relations, whether in private or business life, have become increasingly egalitarian, everyone is on a first-name basis with everyone else, and uncivilized. In distinct contrast, a society in which the right to exclusion is fully restored to owners of private property would be profoundly unegalitarian, intolerant, and discriminatory. There would be little or no tolerance and open-mindedness so dear to left libertarians. Instead, one would be on the right path toward restoring the freedom of association and exclusion implied in the institution of private property if only towns and villages could and would do what they did as a matter of course until well into the 19th century in Europe and the United States. There would be signs regarding entrance requirements to the town and, once in town, requirements for entering specific pieces of property, for example, no beggars, bums, or homeless, but also no homosexuals, drug users, Jews, Muslims, Germans, or Zulus, and those who did not meet these entrance requirements would be kicked out as trespassers. Almost instantly, cultural and moral normalcy would reassert itself. Left libertarians and multi- or countercultural lifestyle experimentalists, even if they were not engaged in any crime, would once again have to pay a price for their behavior. If they continued with their behavior or lifestyle, they would be barred from civilized society and live physically separate from it, in ghettos or on the fringes of society, and many positions or professions would be unattainable to them. In contrast, if they wished to live and advance within society, they would have to adjust and assimilate to the moral and cultural norms of the society they wanted to enter. To thus assimilate would not necessarily imply that one would have to give up one's substandard or abnormal behavior or lifestyle altogether. It would imply, however, that one could no longer come out and exhibit one's alternative behavior or lifestyle in public. Such behavior would have to stay in the closet, hidden from the public eye, and physically restricted to the total privacy of one's own four walls. Advertising or displaying it in public would lead to expulsion. Moreover, true conservative libertarians, in contrast to left libertarians, must not only recognize and emphasize the fact that there will be a sharp increase in discrimination, exclusion, expulsion in a libertarian society wherein private property rights are fully restored to the owners of private households and estates, more importantly, they will have to recognize, and conservatives and conservative insights can be helpful in achieving this, that this ought to be so, that is, that there should be strict discrimination if one wants to reach the goal of a private property anarchy or a pure private law society. Without continued and relentless discrimination, a libertarian society would quickly erode and degenerate into welfare state socialism. Every social order, including a libertarian or conservative one, requires a self-enforcement mechanism. More precisely, social orders, unlike mechanical or biological systems, are not maintained automatically, they require conscious effort and purposeful action on the part of the members of society to prevent them from disintegrating. 6. 
the standard libertarian model of a community is one of individuals who, instead of living physically separated and isolated from one another, associate with each other as neighbors living on adjacent but separately owned pieces of land. However, this model is too simplistic. Presumably, the reason for choosing neighbors over isolation is the fact that for individuals participating in and partaking of the benefits of the division of labor, a neighborhood offers the added advantage of lower transaction costs, that is, a neighborhood facilitates exchange. As a consequence, the value of an individually owned piece of land will be enhanced by the existence of neighboring pieces of land owned by others. However, while this may indeed be true and constitute a valid reason for choosing a neighborhood over physical isolation, it is by no means always true. A neighborhood also involves risks and may lead to falling rather than increasing property values, for even if one assumes, in accordance with the model under consideration, that the initial establishment of neighboring property was mutually beneficial, and even if it is further assumed that all members of a community refrain from criminal activity, it might still happen that a formerly good neighbor turns obnoxious, that he does not take care of his property or changes it so as to negatively affect the property values of other community members, or that he simply refuses to participate in any cooperative effort directed at improving the value of the community as a whole. Hence, in order to overcome the difficulties inherent in community development when the land is held in divided ownership, the formation of neighborhoods and communities has in fact proceeded along different lines from those suggested in the above-mentioned model. Rather than being composed of adjacent pieces of land owned in severalty, then, neighborhoods have typically been proprietary or covenantal communities, founded and owned by a single proprietor who would at least separate parts of the land under specified conditions to selected individuals. Originally, such covenants were based on kinship relations with the role of the proprietor performed by the head of a family or clan. In other words, just as the actions of the immediate family members are coordinated by the head and owner of the household within a single family household, so is the function of directing and coordinating the land uses of groups of neighboring households traditionally fulfilled by the head of an extended kinship group. In modern times, characterized by massive population growth and a significant loss in the importance of kinship relations, this original libertarian model of a proprietary community has been replaced by new and familiar developments such as shopping malls and gated communities. Both shopping centers and gated residential communities are owned by a single entity, either an individual or a private corporation, and the relationship between the community proprietor and his renters and residents is purely contractual. The proprietor is an entrepreneur seeking profits from developing and managing residential and or business communities which attract people as places where they want to reside and or carry on their business. The proprietor, elaborates Spencer McCallum, builds value in the inventory of community land chiefly by satisfying three functional requirements of a community which he alone as an owner can adequately fulfill, selection of members, land planning, and leadership. The first two functions, membership selection and land planning, are accomplished by him automatically in the course of determining to whom, and for what purpose, to let the use of land. The third function, leadership, is his natural responsibility and also his special opportunity, since his interest alone is the success of the whole community rather than that of any special interest within it. Assigning land automatically establishes the kinds of tenants and their spatial juxtaposition to one another and, hence, the economic structure of the community. Leadership also includes arbitration of differences among tenants, as well as guidance and participation in joint efforts and indeed, in a fundamental sense the security of the community is a part of the owner's real estate function. Under land planning, he supervises the design of all construction from the standpoint of safety. He also chooses tenants with a view to their compatibility and complementarity with other members of the community and learns to anticipate in the leases and to provide in other ways against disputes developing among tenants. By his informal peacemaking and arbitrating, he resolves differences that might otherwise become serious. In these many ways he ensures quiet possession, as it was so admirably phrased in the language of the common law, for his tenants. Clearly then, the task of maintaining the covenant entailed in a libertarian, proprietary, community is first and foremost that of the proprietor. Yet he is but one man, and it is impossible for him to succeed in this task unless he is supported in his endeavor by a majority of the members of the community in question. In particular, the proprietor needs the support of the, the community elite, i.e., the heads of households and firms most heavily invested in the community. In order to protect and possibly enhance the value of their property and investments, both proprietor and the community elite must be willing and prepared to take two forms of protective measures. 
First, they must be willing to defend themselves by means of physical force and punishment against external invaders and domestic criminals. But second and equally important, they must also be willing to defend themselves by means of ostracism, exclusion, and ultimately expulsion against those community members who advocate, advertise, or propagandize actions incompatible with the very purpose of the covenant to protect property and family. In this regard, a community always faces the double and related threat of egalitarianism and cultural relativism. Egalitarianism, in every form and shape, is incompatible with the idea of private property. Private property implies exclusivity, inequality, and difference. And cultural relativism is incompatible with the fundamental, indeed foundational, fact of families and intergenerational kinship relations. Families and kinship relations imply cultural absolutism. As a matter of socio-psychological fact, both egalitarian and relativistic sentiments find steady support among ever new generations of adolescents. Owing to their still incomplete mental development, juveniles, especially of the male variety, are always susceptible to both ideas. Adolescence is marked by regular, and for this stage normal, outbreaks of rebellion by the young against the discipline imposed on them by family life and parental authority. Cultural relativism and multiculturalism provide the ideological instrument of emancipating oneself from these constraints. And egalitarianism, based on the infantile view that property is given and thus distributed arbitrarily rather than individually appropriated and produced, and hence distributed justly, i.e. in accordance with personal productivity, provides the intellectual means by which the rebellious youths can lay claim to the economic resources necessary for a life free of and outside the disciplinary framework of families. The enforcement of a covenant is largely a matter of prudence, of course. How and when to react and what protective measures to take requires judgment on the part of the members of the community and especially the proprietor and the community elite. Thus, for instance, so long as the threat of moral relativism and egalitarianism is restricted to a small proportion of juveniles and young adults for only a brief period in life until they settle back into family-constrained adulthood, it may well be sufficient to do nothing at all. The proponents of cultural relativism and egalitarianism would represent little more than temporary embarrassments or irritations, and punishment in the form of ostracism can be quite mild and lenient. A small dose of ridicule and contempt may be all that is needed to contain the relativistic and egalitarian threat. The situation is very different, however, and rather more drastic measures might be required once the spirit of moral relativism and egalitarianism has taken hold among adult members of society, among mothers, fathers, and heads of households and firms. As soon as mature members of society habitually express acceptance or even advocate egalitarian sentiments, whether in the form of democracy, majority rule, or of communism, it becomes essential that other members, and in particular the natural social elites, be prepared to act decisively and, in the case of continued nonconformity, exclude and ultimately expel these members from society. In a covenant concluded among proprietor and community tenants for the purpose of protecting their private property, no such thing as a right to free, unlimited speech exists, not even to unlimited speech on one's own tenant property. One may say innumerable things and promote almost any idea under the sun, but naturally no one is permitted to advocate ideas contrary to the very purpose of the covenant of preserving and protecting private property, such as democracy and communism. There can be no tolerance toward Democrats and Communists in a libertarian social order. They will have to be physically separated and expelled from society. Likewise, in a covenant founded for the purpose of protecting family and kin, there can be no tolerance toward those habitually promoting lifestyles incompatible with this goal. They, the advocates of alternative, non-family and kin-centered lifestyles such as, for instance, individual hedonism, parasitism, nature-environment worship, homosexuality, or communism, will have to be physically removed from society, too, if one is to maintain a libertarian order. 7. It should be obvious then that and why libertarians must be moral and cultural conservatives of the most uncompromising kind. The current state of moral degeneration, social disintegration, and cultural rot is precisely the result of too much, and above all erroneous and misconceived, tolerance. Rather than having all habitual Democrats, Communists, and alternative lifestylists quickly isolated, excluded, and expelled from civilization in accordance with the principles of the covenant, they were tolerated by society. 
Yet this toleration only encouraged and promoted even more egalitarian and relativistic sentiments and attitudes until at last the point was reached where the authority of excluding anyone for anything had effectively evaporated while the power of the state, as manifested in state-sponsored forced integration policies, had correspondingly grown. Libertarians, in their attempt to establish a free natural social order, must strive to regain from the state the right to exclusion inherent in private property. Yet even before they accomplish this and in order to render such an achievement even possible, libertarians cannot soon enough begin to reassert and exercise, to the extent that the situation still permits them to do so, their right to exclusion in everyday life. Libertarians must distinguish themselves from others by practicing, as well as advocating, the most extreme form of intolerance and discrimination against egalitarians, democrats, socialists, communists, multiculturalists, environmentalists, ill-manners, misconduct, incompetence, rudeness, vulgarity, and obscenity. Like true conservatives, who will have to dissociate themselves from the false socialist conservatism of the Buchananites and the neoconservatives, true libertarians must visibly and ostentatiously dissociate themselves from the false multicountercultural and anti authoritarian egalitarian left libertarian imposters. 11. On the errors of classical liberalism and the future of liberty. I. Classical liberalism has been in decline for more than a century. Since the second half of the 19th century, in the US as well as in Western Europe, public affairs have increasingly been shaped instead by socialist ideas. In fact, the 20th century may well be described as the century par excellence of socialism, of communism, fascism, national socialism, and most enduringly of social democracy, modern American liberalism, and neoconservatism. To be sure, this decline has not been a continuous one. Matters did not always become worse from a liberal viewpoint. There were also some reprieves. As a result of World War II, for instance, West Germany and Italy experienced significant liberalization in comparison to the status quo anti under National Socialism and Fascism. Similarly, the collapse of the Communist Soviet Empire in the late 1980s has led to a remarkable liberalization across Eastern Europe. However, as much as liberals welcomed these events, they were not indicative of a renaissance of liberalism. Rather, the liberalization of Germany and Italy in the aftermath of World War II and the current post-communist liberalization of Eastern Europe were the outcome of external and accidental events, of military defeat, and or outright economic bankruptcy. It was in each case liberalization by default of the old system, and the default option adopted subsequently was simply a variant of socialism, social democracy as exemplified by the US as the only surviving, not yet militarily defeated or economically bankrupt, superpower. Thus, even if liberals have enjoyed a few periods of reprieve, ultimately the displacement of liberalism by socialism has been complete. Indeed, so complete has been the socialist victory that today, at the beginning of the 21st century, some neoconservatives have waxed triumphantly about the end of history and the arrival of the last man, i.e., of the last millennium of global U.S. supervised social democracy and a new homo sociodemocraticus. I. I. Even if one regards the Hegelian aspirations of this interpretation as preposterous, according to which liberalism marks only a transitory stage in the evolution of the fully developed social democratic man, liberals still must be pained at the mere appearance of truth of neoconservative philosophizing. Nor can they console themselves with the knowledge that social democracy also is bound to collapse economically. They knew that communism had to collapse, yet when it did, this did not inaugurate a liberal renaissance. There is no a priori reason to assume that the future breakdown of social democracy will bear any more favorable results. Assuming that the course of human history is determined by ideas rather than blind forces and historical changes are the result of ideological shifts in public opinion, it follows that the socialist transformation of the last hundred years must be understood as the result of liberalism's intellectual, philosophical and theoretical defeat, i.e., the increasing rejection in public opinion of the liberal doctrine as faulty. In this situation, liberals can react in two ways. On the one hand, they may still want to maintain that liberalism is a sound doctrine and that the public rejects it in spite of its truth. In this case, one must explain why people cling to false beliefs, even if they are aware of correct liberal ideas. Does the truth not always hold its own attraction and rewards? Furthermore, one must explain why the liberal truth is increasingly rejected in favor of socialist facets. Did the population become more indolent or degenerate? If so, how can this be explained? On the other hand, one may consider the rejection as indicative of an error in one's doctrine. 
In this case, one must reconsider its theoretical foundations and identify the error which can account not only for the doctrine's rejection as false but more importantly for the actual course of events. In other words, the socialist transformation must be explained as an intelligible and systematically predictable progressive deconstruction and degeneration of liberal political theory originating in and logically arising from this era as the ultimate source of all subsequent socialist confusion. Ill. Liberalism's central and momentous error lies in its theory of government. Classical liberal political philosophy, as personified by Locke and most prominently displayed in Jefferson's Declaration of Independence, was first and foremost a moral doctrine. Drawing on the philosophy of the Stoics and the late scholastics, it centered around the notions of self-ownership, original appropriation of nature given, unowned resources, property, and contract as universal human rights implied in the nature of man qua rational animal. In the environment of princely and royal rulers, this emphasis on the universality of human rights placed the liberal philosophy naturally in radical opposition to every established government. For a liberal, every man, whether king or peasant, was subject to the same universal and eternal principles of justice, and a government either could derive its justification from a contract between private property owners or it could not be justified at all. But could any government be so justified? The affirmative liberal answer is well known. It set out from the undeniably true proposition that, mankind being what it is, murderers, robbers, thieves, thugs, and con artists will always exist, and life in society will be impossible if they are not threatened with physical punishment. In order to maintain a liberal social order, liberals insisted, it is necessary that its members be in the position to pressure, by threatening or applying violence, anyone who does not respect the life and property of others to acquiesce to the rules of society. From this correct premise, liberals concluded that this indispensable task of maintaining of law and order is the unique function of government. Whether this conclusion is correct or not hinges on the definition of government. It is correct if government simply means any individual or firm that provides protection and security services to a voluntary paying clientele of private property owners. However, this was not the definition of government adopted by liberals. For a liberal, government is not simply a specialized firm. Rather, government possesses two unique characteristics. Unlike a normal firm, it possesses a compulsory territorial monopoly of jurisdiction, ultimate decision-making, and the right to tax. However, if one assumes this definition of government, then the liberal conclusion is false. It does not follow from the right and need for the protection of person and property that protection rightfully should or effectively can be provided by a monopolist of jurisdiction and taxation. To the contrary, it can be demonstrated that any such institution is incompatible with the rightful and effective protection of property. According to liberal doctrine, private property rights logically and temporally precede any government. They are the result of acts of original appropriation, production, and or exchange from prior to later owner and concern the owner's right to exclusive jurisdiction over definite physical resources. In fact, it is the very purpose of private property to establish physically separate domains of exclusive jurisdiction in order to avoid possible conflicts concerning the use of scarce resources. No private property owner can possibly surrender his right to ultimate jurisdiction over and physical protection of his property to someone else unless he sells or otherwise transfers his property, in which case someone else gains exclusive jurisdiction over it. Every property owner may partake of the advantages of the division of labor, however, and seek more or better protection of his property through cooperation with other owners and their property. Every property owner may buy from, sell to, or otherwise contract with anyone else concerning more or better property protection, and every property owner may at any time unilaterally discontinue any such cooperation with others or change his respective affiliations. Thus, in order to meet the demand for protection, it would be rightfully possible and is economically likely that specialized individuals or agencies would arise which would provide protection, insurance, and arbitration services to voluntary clients for a fee. While it is easy to conceive of the contractual origin of a system of competitive security suppliers, it is inconceivable how private property owners could possibly enter a contract which entitled another agent to compel anyone within a given territory to come to it exclusively for protection and judicial decision-making, barring any other agent from offering protection services. Such a monopoly contract would imply that every private property owner had surrendered his right to ultimate decision-making and the protection of his person and property permanently to someone else. In effect, in transferring this right onto someone else, a person would submit himself into permanent slavery. 
According to liberal doctrine, any such submission contract is from the outset impermissible, hence null and void, because it contradicts the praxeological foundation of all contracts, i.e., private property and individual self-ownership. No one rightfully can or likely will agree to render his person and property permanently defenseless against the actions of someone else. Similarly inconceivable is the notion that anyone would endow his monopolistic protector with the permanent right to tax. No one can or will enter a contract that allowed a protector to determine unilaterally, without consent of the protected, the sum that the protected must pay for his protection. Since Locke, liberals have tried to solve this internal contradiction through the makeshift of tacit, implicit, or conceptual agreements, contracts, or constitutions. Yet all of these characteristically tortuous and confused attempts have only contributed to one and the same unavoidable conclusion that it is impossible to derive a justification for government from explicit contracts between private property owners. IV. Liberalism's erroneous acceptance of the institution of government as consistent with the basic liberal principles of self-ownership, original appropriation, property, and contract consequently led to its own destruction. First and foremost, it follows from the initial error concerning the moral status of government that the liberal solution to the eternal human problem of security, a constitutionally limited government, is a contradictory, praxeologically impossible ideal. Contrary to the original liberal intent of safeguarding liberty and property, every minimal government has the inherent tendency to become a maximal government. Once the principle of government, judicial monopoly, and the power to tax is incorrectly accepted as just, any notion of restraining government power and safeguarding individual liberty and property is illusory. Predictably, under monopolistic auspices the price of justice and protection will continually rise and the quality of justice and protection fall. A tax-funded protection agency is a contradiction in terms, for it is an expropriating property protector that will inevitably lead to more taxes and less protection. Even if, as liberals have proposed, a government limited its activities exclusively to the protection of pre-existing private property rights, the further question of how much security to produce would arise. Motivated, as everyone is, by self-interest and the disutility of labor but equipped with the unique power to tax, a government agent's goal will invariably be to maximize expenditures on protection and almost all of a nation's wealth can conceivably be consumed by the cost of protection and at the same time to minimize the production of protection. The more money one can spend and the less one must work to produce, the better off one will be. Moreover, a judicial monopoly will inevitably lead to a steady deterioration in the quality of protection. If no one can appeal for justice except to government, justice will be perverted in favor of the government, constitutions, and supreme courts notwithstanding. Constitutions and supreme courts are government constitutions and agencies, and whatever limitations on government action they might contain or find is invariably decided by agents of the very institution under consideration. Predictably, the definition of property and protection will continually be altered and the range of jurisdiction expanded to the government's advantage. Second, it follows likewise from the error regarding the moral status of government that the traditional liberal preference for and attachment to local, decentralized and territorially small government is inconsistent and contradictory. Contrary to the original liberal intent, every government, including local government, has an inherent tendency towards centralizing and ultimately becoming a world government. Once it is incorrectly accepted that in order to protect and enforce peaceful cooperation between two individuals A and B, it is justified and necessary to have a judicial monopolist X, a twofold conclusion follows. If more than one territorial monopolist exists, X, Y, and Z, then, just as there can presumably be no peace among A and B without X, so can there be no peace between the monopolists X, Y, and Z as long as they remain in a state of anarchy with each other. Hence, in order to fulfill the liberal desideratum of universal and eternal peace, all political centralization and unification, and ultimately the establishment of a single world government, is justified and. Last, it follows from the error of accepting government as just that the ancient idea of the universality of human rights and the unity of law is confused and, under the heading equality before the law, transformed into a vehicle of egalitarianism. As opposed to the anti-egalitarian or even aristocratic sentiment of old liberals, once the idea of universal human rights is combined with government, the result will be egalitarianism and the destruction of human rights. Once a government has been incorrectly assumed as just and hereditary princes and kings ruled out as incompatible with the idea of universal human rights, the question of how to square government with the idea of the universality and equality of human rights arises. 
the liberal answer is to open participation and entry into government on equal terms to everyone via democracy. Everyone, not just the hereditary class of nobles, is permitted to become a government official and exercise every government function. However, this democratic equality before the law is something entirely different from and incompatible with the idea of one universal law, equally applicable to everyone, everywhere, and at all times. In fact, the former objectionable schism and inequality of the higher law of kings versus the subordinate law of ordinary subjects is fully preserved under democracy in the separation of public versus private law and the supremacy of the former over the latter. Under democracy, everyone is equal insofar as entry into government is open to all on equal terms. In a democracy no personal privileges or privileged persons exist. However, functional privileges and privileged functions exist. As long as they act in official capacity, public officials are governed and protected by public law and occupy thereby a privileged position vis a vis persons acting under the mere authority of private law, most fundamentally in being permitted to support their own activities by taxes imposed on private law subjects. Privilege and legal discrimination will not disappear. To the contrary, Rather than being restricted to princes and nobles, privilege, protectionism, and legal discrimination will be available to all and can be exercised by everyone. Predictably, under democratic conditions the tendency of every monopoly to increase prices and decrease quality will only be stronger and more pronounced. As hereditary monopolist, a king or prince regarded the territory and people under his jurisdiction as his personal property and engaged in the monopolistic exploitation of his property. Under democracy, monopoly and monopolistic exploitation do not disappear. Even if everyone is permitted to enter government, this does eliminate the distinction between the rulers and the ruled. Government and the governed are not one and the same person. Instead of a prince who regards the country as his private property, a temporary and interchangeable caretaker is put in monopolistic charge of the country. The caretaker does not own the country, but as long as he is in office he is permitted to use it to his and his protégé's advantage. He owns its current use, use you fruct, but not its capital stock. This will not eliminate exploitation. To the contrary, it will make exploitation less calculating and more likely to be carried out with little or no regard to the capital stock. In other words, exploitation will be short-sighted. Moreover, with free entry into and public participation in government, the perversion of justice will proceed even faster. Instead of protecting pre-existing private property rights, democratic government will become a machine for the continual redistribution of pre-existing property rights in the name of illusory social security until the idea of universal and immutable human rights disappears and is replaced by that of law as positive government-made legislation. V. In light of this, an answer to the question of the future of liberalism can be sought. Because of its own fundamental error regarding the moral status of government, liberalism actually contributed to the destruction of everything it had originally set out to preserve and protect, liberty and property. Once the principle of government had been incorrectly accepted, it was only a matter of time until the ultimate triumph of socialism over liberalism. The present neoconservative end of history of global U.S. enforced social democracy is the result of two centuries of liberal confusion. Thus, liberalism in its present form has no future. Rather, its future is social democracy, and the future has already arrived, and we know that it does not work. Once the premise of government is accepted, liberals are left without argument when socialists pursue this premise to its logical end. If monopoly is just, then centralization is just. If taxation is just, then more taxation is also just. And if democratic equality is just, then the expropriation of private property owners is just, too, while private property is not. Indeed, what can a liberal say in favor of less taxation and redistribution? If it is admitted that taxation and monopoly are just, then the liberal has no principal moral case to make. To lower taxes is not a moral imperative. Rather, the liberal case is exclusively an economic one. For instance, lower taxes will produce certain long-run economic benefits. However, at least in the short run and for some people, the current tax recipients, lower taxes also imply economic costs. Without moral argument at his disposal, a liberal is left only with the tool of cost-benefit analysis, but any such analysis must involve an interpersonal comparison of utility, and such a comparison is impossible, scientifically impermissible. 
Hence, the outcome of cost-benefit analyses is arbitrary, and every proposal justified with reference to them is mere opinion. In this situation, democratic socialists only appear more upfront, consistent, and consequent, while liberals come across as starry-eyed, confused, and unprincipled or even opportunistic. They accept the basic premise of the current order of democratic government, but then constantly lament its anti-liberal outcome. If liberalism is to have any future, it must repair its fundamental error. Liberals will have to recognize that no government can be contractual justified, that every government is destructive of what they want to preserve, and that protection and the production of security can only be rightfully and effectively undertaken by a system of competitive security suppliers. That is, liberalism will have to be transformed into the theory of private property anarchism or a private law society, as first outlined nearly 150 years ago by Gustave de Molinari and in our own time fully elaborated by Murray Rothbard. Such a theoretical transformation would have an immediate twofold effect. On the one hand, it would lead to a purification of the contemporary liberal movement. Social Democrats in liberal clothes and many high-ranking liberal government functionaries would swiftly disassociate themselves from this new liberal movement. On the other hand, the transformation would lead to the systematic radicalization of the liberal movement. For those members of the movement who still hold on to the classic notion of universal human rights and the idea that self-ownership and private property rights precede all government and legislation, the transition from liberalism to private property anarchism is only a small intellectual step, especially in light of the obvious failure of democratic government to provide the only service that it was ever intended to provide, that of protection. Private property anarchism is simply consistent liberalism, liberalism thought through to its ultimate conclusion, or liberalism restored to its original intent. However, this small theoretical step has momentous practical implications. In taking this step, liberals would renounce their allegiance to the present system, denounce democratic government as illegitimate, and reclaim their right to self-protection. Politically, with this step they would return to the very beginnings of liberalism as a revolutionary creed. In denying the validity of all hereditary privileges, classical liberals would be placed in fundamental opposition to all established governments. Characteristically, liberalism's greatest political triumph, the American Revolution, was the outcome of a secessionist war. And in the Declaration of Independence, in justifying the actions of the American colonists, Jefferson affirmed that governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed to secure the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness and that whenever any form of government becomes destructive of these ends, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Private property anarchists would only reaffirm the classic liberal right to throw off such government and to provide new guards for their future security. Of course, by itself the renewed radicalism of the liberal movement would be of little consequence, although as the American Revolution teaches, radicalism may well be popular. Instead, it is the inspiring vision of a fundamental alternative to the present system which flows from this new radicalism that will finally break the social democratic machine. Rather than supranational political integration, world government, constitutions, courts, banks, and money, global social democracy, and universal and ubiquitous multiculturalism, anarchist liberals propose the decomposition of the nation-state into its constituent heterogeneous parts. As their classic forebears, new liberals do not seek to take over any government. They ignore government. They only want to be left alone by government and secede from its jurisdiction to organize their own protection. Unlike their predecessors who merely sought to replace a larger government with a smaller one, however, new liberals pursue the logic of secession to its end. They propose unlimited secession, i.e., the unrestricted proliferation of independent free territories, until the state's range of jurisdiction finally withers away to this end, and in complete contrast to the statist projects of European integration and a new world order, they promote the vision of a world of tens of thousands of free countries, regions, and cantons, of hundreds of thousands of independent free cities, such as the present-day oddities of Monaco, Andorra, San Marino, Liechtenstein, formerly Hong Kong, and Singapore, and even more numerous free districts and neighborhoods, economically integrated through free trade, the smaller the territory, the greater the economic pressure of opting for free trade and an international gold commodity money standard. If and when this alternative liberal vision gains prominence in public opinion, the end of the social democratic end of history will give rise to a liberal renaissance. 12. On Government and the Private Production of Defense 
It is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. Declaration of Independence I. Among the most popular and consequential beliefs of our age is the belief in collective security. Nothing less significant than the legitimacy of the modern state rests on this belief. I will demonstrate that the idea of collective security is a myth that provides no justification for the modern state and that all security is and must be private. First off, I will present a two-step reconstruction of the myth of collective security and at each step raise a few theoretical concerns. The myth of collective security can also be called the Hobbesian myth. Thomas Hobbes and countless political philosophers and economists after him argued that in the state of nature, men would constantly be at each other's throats. Homo homini lupus estimated put in modern jargon in the state of nature a permanent underproduction of security would prevail. Each individual, left to his own devices and provisions, would spend too little on his own defense, resulting in permanent interpersonal warfare. The solution to this presumably intolerable situation, according to Hobbes and his followers, is the establishment of a state. In order to institute peaceful cooperation among themselves, two individuals, A and B, require a third independent party, S, as ultimate judge and peacemaker. However, this third party, S, is not just another individual, and the good provided by S, that of of security, is not just another private good. Rather, S is a sovereign and has as such two unique powers. On the one hand, S can insist that his subjects, A and B, not seek protection from anyone but him, that is, S is a compulsory territorial monopolist of protection. On the other hand, S can determine unilaterally how much A and B must spend on their own security, that is, S has the power to impose taxes in order to provide security collectively. There is little use in quarreling over whether man is as bad and wolf-like as Hobbes supposes or not, except to note that Hobbes' thesis obviously cannot mean that man is driven only and exclusively by aggressive instincts. If this were the case, mankind would have died out long ago. The fact that he did not demonstrates that man also possesses reason and is capable of constraining his natural impulses. The quarrel is only with the Hobbesian solution. Given man's nature as a rational animal is the proposed solution to the problem of insecurity and improvement. Can the institution of a state reduce aggressive behavior and promote peaceful cooperation and thus provide for better private security and protection? The difficulties with Hobbes' argument are obvious. For one, regardless of how bad men are, s, whether king, dictator, or elected president is still one of them. Man's nature is not transformed upon becoming s. Yet how can there be better protection for A and B if S must tax them in order to provide it? Is there not a contradiction within the very construction of S as an expropriating property protector? In fact, is this not exactly what is also, and more appropriately, referred to as a protection racket? To be sure, S will make peace between A and B but only so that he himself can rub both of them more profitably. Surely S is better protected, but the more he is protected, the lesser and be a protected from attacks by S. Collective security, it would seem, is not better private security. Rather, it is the private security of the state, S, achieved through the expropriation, i.e., the economic disarmament of its subjects. Further, statists from Thomas Hobbes to James Buchanan have argued that a protective state S would come about as the result of some sort of constitutional contract. Yet who in his right mind would agree to a contract that allowed one's protector to determine unilaterally and irrevocably the sum that the protected must pay for his protection? The fact is no one ever has. Let me interrupt my discussion and return to the reconstruction of the Hobbesian myth. Once it is assumed that in order to institute peaceful cooperation between A and B it is necessary to have a state S, a twofold conclusion follows. If more than one state exists, SI, S2, S3, then, just as there can presumably be no peace among A and B without S, so can there be no peace between the states SI, S2, and S3 as long as they remain in a state of nature, i.e., a state of anarchy, with regard to each other. Consequently, in order to achieve universal peace, political centralization, unification, and ultimately the establishment of a single world government, are necessary. It is useful to indicate what can be taken as non controversial. To begin with, the argument is correct, as far as it goes. If the premise is correct, then the consequence spelled out does follow. As well, the empirical assumptions involved in the Hobbesian account appear at first glance to be borne out by the facts. 
It is true that states are constantly at war with each other and a historical tendency toward political centralization and global rule does indeed appear to be occurring. Quarrels arise only with the explanation of this fact and tendency and the classification of a single unified world state as an improvement in the provision of private security and protection. There appears to be an empirical anomaly for which the Habesian argument cannot account. The reason for the warring among different states SI, S2, and S3, according to Hobbes, is that they are in a state of anarchy vis-a-vis -vis each other. However, before the arrival of a single world state not only are SI, S2, and S3 in a state of anarchy relative to each other but in fact every subject of one state is in a state of anarchy vis-a-vis -vis every subject of any other state. Accordingly, just as much war and aggression should exist between the private citizens of various states as between different states. Empirically, however, this is not so. The private dealings between foreigners appear to be significantly less warlike than the dealings between different governments. Nor does this seem to be surprising. After all, a state agent S, in contrast to every one of its subjects, can rely on domestic taxation in the conduct of his foreign affairs. Given his natural human aggressiveness, is it not obvious that S will be more brazen and aggressive in his conduct toward foreigners if he can externalize the cost of such behavior onto others? Surely, I would be willing to take greater risks and engage in more provocation and aggression if I could make others pay for it. And surely there would be a tendency of one state, one protection racket, to want to expand its territorial protection monopoly at the expense of other states and thus bring about world government as the ultimate result of interstate competition. But how is this an improvement in the provision of private security and protection? The opposite seems to be the case. The world state is the winner of all wars and the last surviving protection racket. Doesn't this make it particularly dangerous? Will not the physical power of any single world government be overwhelming as compared to that of any one of its individual subjects? Aye aye. Let me pause in my abstract theoretical considerations to take a brief look at the empirical evidence bearing on the issue at hand. As noted at the outset, the myth of collective security is as widespread as it is consequential. I am not aware of any survey on this matter, but I would venture to predict that the Habesian myth is accepted more or less unquestioningly by well over 90% of the adult population that a state is indispensable for protection and defense. However, to believe something does not make it true. Rather, if what one believes is false, one's actions will lead to failure. What about the evidence? Does it support Hobbes and his followers, or does it confirm the opposite anarchist fears and contentions? The US was explicitly founded as a protective state a la Hobbes. Let me quote to this effect from Jefferson's Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with inalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men, deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. Here we have it, the US government was instituted to fulfill one and only one task, the protection of life and property. Thus, it should provide the perfect example for judging the validity of the Habesian claim as to the status of states as protectors. After more than two centuries of protective statism, what is the status of our protection and peaceful human cooperation? Was the American experiment in protective statism a success? According to the pronouncements of our state rulers and their intellectual bodyguards, of whom there are more than ever before, we are better protected and more secure than ever. We are supposedly protected from global warming and cooling, from the extinction of animals and plants, from the abuses of husbands and wives, parents and employers, from poverty, disease, disaster, ignorance, prejudice, racism, sexism, homophobia, and countless other public enemies and dangers. In fact, however, matters are strikingly different. In order to provide us with all this protection, the state managers expropriate more than 40% of the incomes of private producers year in and year out. Government debt and liabilities have increased uninterruptedly, thus increasing the need for future expropriations. Owing to the substitution of government paper money for gold, financial insecurity has increased sharply and we are continually robbed through currency depreciation. Every detail of private life, property, trade, and contract is regulated by ever higher mountains of laws, legislation, thereby creating permanent legal uncertainty and moral hazard. In particular, we have been gradually stripped of the right to exclusion implied in the very concept of private property. As sellers we cannot sell to and as buyers we cannot buy from whomever we wish. 
and as members of associations we are not permitted to enter into whatever restrictive covenant we believe to be mutually beneficial. As Americans, we must accept immigrants we do not want as our neighbors. As teachers, we cannot get rid of ill-behaved students. As employers, we are stuck with incompetent or destructive employees. As landlords, we are forced to cope with bad tenants. As bankers and insurers, we are not allowed to avoid bad risks. As restaurant or bar owners, we must accommodate unwelcome customers. And as members of private associations, we are compelled to accept individuals and actions in violation of our own rules and restrictions. In short, the more the state has increased its expenditures on social security and public safety, the more our private property rights have been eroded, the more our property has been expropriated, confiscated, destroyed, or depreciated, and the more we have been deprived of the very foundation of all protection, economic independence, financial strength, and personal wealth. The path of every president and practically every member of Congress is littered with hundreds of thousands of nameless victims of personal economic ruin, financial bankruptcy, emergency, impoverishment, despair, hardship, and frustration. The picture appears even bleaker when we consider foreign affairs. Seldom during its entire history has the continental US been territorially attacked by any foreign army. Pearl Harbor was the result of a preceding US provocation. Yet the US, has the distinction of having had a government that declared war against a large part of its own population and engaged in the wanton murder of hundreds of thousands of its own citizens. Moreover, while the relations between American citizens and foreigners do not appear to be unusually contentious, almost from its very beginnings the US government relentlessly pursued aggressive expansionism. Beginning with the Spanish-American War, reaching a peak in World War I and World War II, and continuing to the present, the US government has become entangled in hundreds of foreign conflicts and risen to the rank of the world's dominant imperialist power. Thus, nearly every president since the turn of this century has also been responsible for the murder, killing, or starvation of countless innocent foreigners all over the world. In short, while we have become more helpless, impoverished, threatened and insecure, the US government has become ever more brazen and aggressive. In the name of national security, it defends us, equipped with enormous stockpiles of weapons of aggression and mass destruction, by bullying ever new Hitlers, big or small, and all suspected Hitlerite sympathizers anywhere and everywhere outside of the territory of the US. The empirical evidence thus seems clear. The belief in a protective state appears to be a patent error, and the American experiment in protective statism a complete failure. The US government does not protect us. To the contrary, there exists no greater danger to our life, property, and prosperity than the US government, and the US president in particular is the world's single most threatening and armed danger, capable of ruining everyone who opposes him and destroying the entire globe. Ill. Statists react much like socialists when faced with the dismal economic performance of the Soviet Union and its satellites. They do not necessarily deny the disappointing facts, but they try to argue them away by claiming that these facts are the result of a systematic discrepancy, deviancy, between real and ideal or true statism, respectively socialism. To this day, socialists claim that true socialism has not been refuted by the empirical evidence and that everything would have turned out well and unparalleled prosperity would have resulted if only Trotsky's or Bukharin's or better still their very own brand of socialism, rather than Stalin's, had been implemented. Similarly, statists interpret all seemingly contradictory evidence as only accidental. If only some other president had come to power at this or that turn in history or if only this or that constitutional change or amendment had been adopted, everything would have turned out beautifully and unparalleled security and peace would have resulted. Indeed, this may still happen in the future if their own policies are employed. We have learned from Ludwig von Mises how to respond to the socialists' evasion, immunization, strategy. As long as the defining characteristic, the essence, of socialism, i.e., the absence of the private ownership of factors of production, remains in place, no reform will be of any help. The idea of a socialist economy is a contradiction in terms, and the claim that socialism represents a higher, more efficient mode of social production is absurd. In order to reach one's own ends efficiently and without waste within the framework of an exchange economy based on division of labor, it is necessary that one engage in monetary calculation, cost accounting. Everywhere outside the system of a primitive self-sufficient single household economy, monetary calculation is the sole tool of rational and efficient action. 
Only by comparing inputs and outputs arithmetically in terms of a common medium of exchange, money, can a person determine whether his actions are successful or not. In distinct contrast, socialism means to have no economy, no economizing, at all, because under these conditions monetary calculation and cost accounting is impossible by definition. If no private property in factors of production exists, then no prices for any production factor exists, hence, it is impossible to determine whether or not they are employed economically. Accordingly, socialism is not a higher mode of production but rather economic chaos and regression to primitivism. How to respond to the statist's evasion strategy has been explained by Murray-Anne Rothbard. But Rothbard's lesson, while equally simple and clear and of even more momentous implications, has remained to this day far less known and appreciated. So long as the defining characteristic, the essence, of a state remains in place, he explained, no reform, whether of personnel or constitutional, will be to any avail. Given the principle of government, judicial monopoly and the power to tax, any notion of limiting its power and safeguarding individual life and property is illusory. Under monopolistic auspices the price of justice and protection must rise and its quality must fall. A tax-funded protection agency is a contradiction in terms and will lead to ever more taxes and less protection. Even if a government limited its activities exclusively to the protection of pre-existing property rights, as every protective state is supposed to do, the further question of how much security to provide would arise. Motivated, like everyone else, by self-interest and the disutility of labor but with the unique power to tax, a government's answer will invariably be the same, to maximize expenditures on protection, and almost all of a nation's wealth can conceivably be consumed by the cost of protection, and at the same time to minimize the production of protection. Furthermore, a judicial monopoly must lead to a deterioration in the quality of justice and protection. If one can only appeal to government for justice and protection, justice and protection will be perverted in favor of government, constitutions and supreme courts notwithstanding. After all, constitutions and supreme courts are state constitutions and courts, and whatever limitations to government action they might contain is determined by agents of the very institution under consideration. Accordingly, the definition of property and protection will continually be altered and the range of jurisdiction expanded to the government's advantage. Hence, Rothbard pointed out, it follows that just as socialism cannot be reformed but must be abolished in order to achieve prosperity, so can the institution of the state not be reformed but must be abolished in order to achieve justice and protection. Defense in the free society, including such defense services to person and property as police protection and judicial findings, comma, Rothbard concluded, would therefore have to be supplied by people or firms who a, gained their revenue voluntarily rather than by coercion and b, did not, as the state does, arrogate to themselves a compulsory monopoly of police or judicial protection. Defense firms would have to be as freely competitive and as non-coercive against non-invaders as are all other suppliers of goods and services on the free market. Defense services, like all other services, would be marketable and marketable only. That is, every private property owner would be able to partake of the advantages of the division of labor and seek better protection of his property than that afforded through self-defense by cooperation with other owners and their property. Anyone could buy from, sell to, or otherwise contract with anyone else concerning protective and judicial services, and one could at any time unilaterally discontinue any such cooperation with others and fall back on self-reliant defense or change one's protective affiliations. IV. Having reconstructed the myth of collective security, the myth of the state, and criticized it on theoretical and empirical grounds, I now must take on the task of constructing the positive case for private security and protection. In order to dispel the myth of collective security, it is not just sufficient to grasp the error involved in the idea of a protective state. It is just as important, if not more so, to gain a clear understanding of how the non-statist security alternative would effectively work. Rothbard, building on the path-breaking analysis of the French-Belgian economist Gustave de Molinari, has given us a sketch of the workings of a free market system of protection and defense. As well, we are in debt to Morris and Linda Tanhall for their brilliant insights and analyzes in this regard. Following their lead, I will proceed with my analysis and provide a more comprehensive view of the alternative, non-statist, system of security production and its ability to handle attacks, not just by individuals or gangs but in particular also by states. Widespread agreement exists among liberal libertarians such as Molinari, Rothbard, and the Tanhals as well as most other commentators on the matter that defense is a form of insurance and defense expenditures represent a sort of insurance premium price. 
Accordingly, as Rothbard and the Tannholz in particular would emphasize, within the framework of a complex modern economy based on worldwide division of labor, the most likely candidates to offer protection and defense services are insurance agencies. The better the protection of insured property, the lower are the damage claims and hence an insurer's costs. Thus, to provide efficient protection appears to be in every insurer's own financial interest. Indeed, although restricted and hampered by the state, even now insurance agencies provide wide-ranging services of protection and indemnification, compensation, to injured private parties. Insurance companies fulfill a second essential requirement. Obviously, anyone offering protection services must appear able to deliver on his promises in order to find clients. That is, he must possess the economic means, the manpower as well as the physical resources necessary to accomplish the task of dealing with the dangers, actual or imagined, of the real world. On this count insurance agencies appear to be perfect candidates, too. They operate on a nationwide and even international scale, and they own large property holdings dispersed over wide territories and beyond single state boundaries. Accordingly, they have a manifest self-interest in effective protection and are big and economically powerful. Furthermore, all insurance companies are connected through a network of contractual agreements of mutual assistance and arbitration as well as a system of international reinsurance agencies representing a combined economic power which dwarfs that of most existing governments. Let me further analyze and systematically clarify this suggestion that protection and defense are insurance and can be provided by insurance agencies. To reach this goal, two issues must be addressed. First off, it is not possible to insure oneself against every risk of life. I cannot insure myself against committing suicide, for instance, or against burning down my own house, becoming unemployed, not feeling like getting out of bed in the morning, or not suffering entrepreneurial losses, because in each case I have full or partial control over the likelihood of the respective outcome. Risks such as these must be assumed individually. No one but I can possibly deal with them. Hence, the first question must be what makes protection and defense an insurable rather than an insurable risk. After all, as we have just seen, this is not self-evident. In fact, does not everyone have considerable control over the likelihood of an attack on and invasion of his person and property? Do I not deliberately bring about an attack by assaulting or provoking someone else, for instance, and is not protection then an insurable risk, like suicide or unemployment, for which each person must assume sole responsibility? The answer is a qualified yes and no. Yes, insofar as no one can possibly offer unconditional protection, i.e., insurance against any invasion whatsoever. That is, unconditional protection can only be provided, if at all, by each individual on his own and for himself. But the answer is no, insofar as conditional protection is concerned. Only attacks and invasions that are provoked by the victim cannot be insured. Unprovoked and thus accidental attacks can be insured against, however. That is, protection becomes an insurable good only if and insofar as an insurance agent contractual restricts the actions of the insured so as to exclude every possible provocation on their part. Various insurance companies may differ with respect to the specific definition of provocation, but there can be no difference between insurers with regard to the principle that everyone must systematically exclude, prohibit, all provocative and aggressive action among its own clients. As elementary as this first insight into the essentially defensive, non-aggressive and non-provocative nature of protection insurance may seem, it is of fundamental importance. For one, it implies that any known aggressor and provocateur would be unable to find an insurer and hence would be economically isolated, weak and vulnerable. On the other hand, it implies that anyone wanting more protection than that afforded by self-reliant self-defense could do so only if and insofar as he submitted himself to specified norms of non-aggressive, civilized conduct. Further, the greater the number of insured people, and in a modern exchange economy most people want more than just self-defense for their protection, the greater would be the economic pressure on the remaining uninsured to adopt the same or similar standards of non-aggressive social conduct. Moreover, as the result of competition between insurers for voluntarily paying clients, a tendency toward falling prices per insured property values would come about. At the same time, a system of competing insurers would have a twofold impact on the development of law and thus contribute further to reduce conflict. On the one hand, the system would allow for systematically increased variability and flexibility of law. 
rather than imposing a uniform set of standards onto everyone as under statist conditions insurance agencies could and would compete against each other not just via price but in particular also through product differentiation and development. Insurers could and would differ and distinguish themselves with respect to the behavioural code imposed on and expected of their clients with respect to rules of evidence and procedure and or with respect to the sort and assignment of awards and punishments. There could and would exist side by side, for instance, Catholic insurers applying canon law, Jewish insurers applying Mosaic law, Muslims applying Islamic law, and non-believers applying secular law of one variant or another, all of them sustained by and vying for a voluntarily paying clientele. Consumers could and would choose, and sometimes change, the law applied to them and their property. That is, no one would be forced to live under foreign law, and hence, a prominent source of conflict would be eliminated. On the other hand, a system of insurers offering competing law codes would promote a tendency toward the unification of law. The domestic Catholic, Jewish, Roman, Germanic, etc. law would apply and be binding only on the persons and properties of the insured, the insurer, and all others insured by the same insurer under the same law. Canon law, for instance, would apply only to professed Catholics and deal solely with intra-Catholic conflict and conflict resolution. Yet it would also be possible for a Catholic to interact, come into conflict with, and wish to be protected from the subscribers of other law codes, example, a Muslim. From this no difficulty would arise so long as Catholic and Islamic law reached the same or a similar conclusion regarding the case and contenders at hand. But if competing law codes arrive at distinctly different conclusions, as they would in at least some cases by virtue of the fact that they represent different law codes, a problem would arise. The insured would want to be protected against the contingency of intergroup conflict, too, but domestic intragroup law would be of no avail in this regard. In fact, at a minimum two distinct domestic law codes would be involved, and they would come to different conclusions. In such a situation it could not be expected that one insurer and the subscribers of his law code, say the Catholics, would simply subordinate their judgment to that of another insurer and his law, say that of the Muslims, or vice versa. Rather, each insurer, Catholic and Muslim alike, would have to contribute to the development of intergroup law, i.e., law applicable in cases of disagreement among competing insurers and law codes. And because the intergroup law provisions that an insurer offered to its clients could appear credible to them, and hence a good, only if and insofar as the same provisions were also accepted by other insurers, and the more of them, the better, competition would promote the development and refinement of a body of law that incorporated the widest intergroup, cross-cultural, etc., legal moral consensus and agreement and thus represented the greatest common denominator among various competing law. Codes. More specifically, because competing insurers and law codes could and would disagree regarding the merit of at least some of the cases brought jointly before them, every insurer would be compelled to submit itself and its clients in these cases from the outset to arbitration by an independent third party. This third party would not just be independent of the two disagreeing parties, however. It would at the same time be the unanimous choice of both parties. And as objects of unanimous choice, arbitrators then would represent or even personify consensus and agreeability. They would be agreed upon because of their commonly perceived ability of finding and formulating mutually agreeable, i.e., fair, solutions in cases of intergroup disagreement. Moreover, if an arbitrator failed in this task and arrived at conclusions that were perceived as unfair or biased by either one of the insurers and or their clients, this person would not likely be chosen again as an arbitrator in the future. Consequently, protection and security contracts would come into existence as the first fundamental result of competition between insurers for a voluntarily paying clientele. Insurers, unlike states, would offer their clients contracts with well-specified property and product descriptions and clearly defined and delineated duties and obligations. Likewise, the relationship between insurers and arbitrators would be defined and governed by contract. Each party to a contract, for the duration or until fulfillment of the contract, would be bound by its terms and conditions, and every change in the terms or conditions of a contract would require the unanimous consent of all parties concerned. That is, under competition, unlike under statist conditions, no legislation would or could exist. No insurer could get away, as a state can, with promising its clients protection without letting them know how or at what price and insisting that it could, if it so desired, unilaterally change the terms and conditions of the protector-client relationship. Insurance clients would demand something significantly better and insurers would comply and supply contracts and constant law instead of promises and shifting and changing legislation. 
Furthermore, as a result of the continual cooperation of various insurers and arbitrators a tendency toward the unification of property and contract law and the harmonization of the rules of procedure, evidence and conflict resolution, including such questions as liability, tort, compensation, and punishment, would be set in motion. On account of buying protection insurance, everyone would become tied into a global competitive enterprise of striving to reduce conflict and enhance security. Moreover, every single conflict and damage claim, regardless where and by or against whom, would fall into the jurisdiction of one or more specific insurance agencies and would be handled either by an individual insurer's domestic law or by the international law provisions and procedures agreed upon in advance by a group of insurers, thus assuring ex ante complete and perfect legal stability and certainty. V. Now a second question must be addressed. Even if the status of defensive protection as an insurable good is granted, distinctly different forms of insurance exist. Let us consider just two characteristic examples, insurance against natural disasters, such as earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, and insurance against industrial accidents or disasters, such as malfunctions, explosions, and defective products. The former can serve as an example of group or mutual insurance. Some territories are more prone to natural disasters than others, accordingly, the demand for and price of insurance will be higher in some areas than others. However, every location within certain territorial borders is regarded by the insurer as homogeneous with respect to the risk concerned. The insurer presumably knows the frequency and extent of the event in question for the region as a whole, but he knows nothing about the particular risk of any specific location within the territory. In this case, every insured person will pay the same premium per insured value, and the premiums collected in one time period will presumably be sufficient to cover all damage claims during the same time period, otherwise the insurance industry will incur losses. Thus, the particular individual risks are pooled and insured mutually. In contrast, industrial insurance can serve as an example of individual insurance. Unlike natural disasters, the insured risk is the outcome of human action, i.e., of production efforts. Every production process is under the control of an individual producer. No producer intends to fail or experience a disaster, and as we have seen only accidental, non-intended, disasters are insurable. Yet even if production is largely controlled and generally successful, every producer and production technology is subject to occasional mishaps and accidents beyond his control, a margin of error. However, since it is the outcome, intended or not, of individual production efforts and production techniques, this risk of industrial accidents is essentially different from one producer and production process to another. Accordingly, the risk of different producers and production technologies cannot be pooled, and every producer must be insured individually. In this case, the insurer will have to know the frequency of the questionable event over time, but he cannot know the likelihood of the event at any specific point in time, except that at all times the same producer and production technology are in operation. There is no presumption that the premiums collected during any given period will be sufficient to cover all damage claims arising during that period. Rather, the profit-making presumption is that all premiums collected over many time periods will be sufficient to cover all claims during the same multi-period time span. Consequently, in this case an insurer must hold capital reserves in order to fulfill its contractual obligation, and in calculating his premiums he must take the present value of these reserves into account. The second question is what kind of insurance can protect against aggression and invasion by other actors? Can it be provided as group insurance, as for natural disasters, or must it be offered in the form of individual insurance, as in the case of industrial accidents? Note that both forms of insurance represent only the two possible extremes of a continuum, and that the position of any particular risk on this continuum is not definitively fixed. Owing to scientific and technological advances in materiology, geology, or engineering, for instance, risks that were formerly regarded as homogeneous, allowing for mutual insurance, can become more and more dehomogenized. Noteworthy is this tendency in the field of medical and health insurance. With the advances of genetics and genetic engineering, genetic fingerprinting, medical and health risks previously regarded as homogeneous, unspecific, with respect to large numbers of people have become increasingly more specific and heterogeneous. With this in mind, can anything specific be said about protection insurance in particular? I would think so. After all, while all insurance requires that the risk be accidental from the standpoint of the insurer and the insured, the accident of an aggressive invasion is distinctly different from that of natural or industrial disasters. 
Whereas natural disasters and industrial accidents are the outcome of natural forces and the operation of laws of nature, aggression is the outcome of human actions, and whereas nature is blind and does not discriminate between individuals, whether at the same point in time or over time, an aggressor can discriminate and deliberately target specific victims and choose the timing of his attack. 6. Let me first contrast defense protection insurance with that against natural disasters. Frequently an analogy between the two is drawn, and it is instructive to examine if or to what extent it holds. The analogy is that just as every individual within certain geographical regions is threatened by the same risk of earthquakes, floods, or hurricanes, so does every inhabitant within the territory of the US or Germany, for instance, face the same risk of being victimized by a foreign attack. Some superficial similarity, to which I shall come shortly, notwithstanding, it is easy to recognize two fundamental shortcomings in the analogy. For one, the borders of earthquake, flood, or hurricane regions are established according to objective physical criteria and hence can be referred to as natural. In distinct contrast, political boundaries are artificial boundaries. The borders of the US changed throughout the entire 19th century and Germany did not exist as such until 1871 and was composed of 38 separate countries. Surely, no one would want to claim that this redrawing of the US or German borders was the outcome of the discovery that the security risk of every American or German within the greater US or Germany was, contrary to the previously held opposite belief, homogeneous, identical. There is a second obvious shortcoming. Nature, earthquakes, floods, hurricanes, is blind in its destruction. It does not discriminate between more and less valuable locations and objects but attacks indiscriminately. In distinct contrast, an aggressive invader can and does discriminate. He does not attack or invade worthless locations and things, like the Sahara Desert, but targets locations and things that are valuable. Other things being equal, the more valuable a location and an object, the more likely it will be the target of an invasion. This raises the next crucial question. If political borders are arbitrary and attacks are never indiscriminate but directed specifically toward valuable places and things, are there any non-arbitrary borders separating different security risk, attack zones? The answer is yes. Such non-arbitrary borders are those of private property. Private property is the result of the appropriation and or production of particular physical objects or effects by specific individuals at specific locations. Every appropriator producer, owner, demonstrates with his actions that he regards the appropriated and produced things as valuable goods, otherwise he would not have appropriated or produced them. The borders of everyone's property are objective and intersubjectively ascertainable. They are simply determined by the extension and dimension of the things appropriated and or produced by any one particular individual. And the borders of all valuable places and things are coextensive with the borders of all property. At any given point in time, every valuable place and thing is owned by someone, only worthless places and things are owned by no one. Surrounded by other men every appropriator and producer can also become the object of an attack or invasion. Every property, in contrast to things, matter, is necessarily valuable, hence, every property owner becomes a possible target of other men's aggressive desires. Consequently, every owner's choice of the location and form of his property will, among countless other considerations, also be influenced by security concerns. Other things equal, everyone will prefer safer locations and forms of property to locations and forms which are less safe. Yet regardless of where an owner and his property are located and whatever the property's physical form, every owner, by virtue of not abandoning his property even in view of potential aggression, demonstrates his personal willingness to protect and defend these possessions. However, if the borders of private property are the only non-arbitrary borders standing in systematic relation to the risk of aggression, then it follows that as many different security zones as there are separately owned property holdings exist, and that these zones are no larger than the extension of these holdings. That is, even more so than in the case of industrial accidents, the insurance of property against aggression would seem to be an example of individual rather than group mutual protection. Whereas the accident risk of an individual production process is typically independent of its location, such that if the process were replicated by the same producer at different locations his margin of error would remain the same, the risk of aggression against private property, the production plant, is different from one location to another. By its very nature as privately appropriated and produced goods, property is always separate and distinct. Every property is located at a different place and under the control of a different individual, and each location faces a unique security risk. 
It can make a difference for my security, for instance, if I reside in the countryside or the city, on a hill or in a valley, or near or far from a river, ocean, harbour, railroad, or street. In fact, even contiguous locations do not face the same risk. It can make a difference, for instance, if I reside higher or lower on the mountain than my neighbour, upstream or downstream, closer or more distant from the ocean, or simply north, south, west, or east of him. Moreover, every property, wherever it is located, can be shaped and transformed by its owner so as to increase its safety and reduce the likelihood of aggression. I may acquire a gun or safe deposit box, for instance, or I may be able to shoot down an attacking plane from my backyard or own a laser gun that can kill an aggressor thousands of miles away. Thus, no location and no property are like any other. Every owner will have to be insured individually, and to do so every aggression insurer must hold sufficient capital reserves. 7. The analogy typically drawn between insurance against natural disasters and external aggression is fundamentally flawed. As aggression is never indiscriminate but selective and targeted, so is defence. Everyone has different locations and things to defend, and no one's security risk is the same as anyone else's, yet the analogy contains a kernel of truth. However, any similarity between natural disasters and external aggression is due not to the nature of aggression and defence but to the rather specific nature of state aggression and defence into state warfare. As explained above, a state is an agency that exercises a compulsory territorial monopoly of protection and the power to tax, and any such agency will be comparatively more aggressive because it can externalize the costs of such behavior onto its subjects. However, the existence of a state does not just increase the frequency of aggression, it changes its entire character. The existence of states, and especially of democratic states, implies that aggression and defense, war, will tend to be transformed into total, undiscriminating war. Consider for a moment a completely stateless world. While most property owners would be individually insured by large, often multinational insurance companies endowed with huge capital reserves as bad risks most if not all aggressors would be without any insurance whatever. In this situation, every aggressor or group of aggressors would want to limit their targets, preferably to uninsured property, and avoid all collateral damage, as they would otherwise find themselves confronted with one or many economically powerful professional defense agencies. Likewise, all defensive violence would be highly selective and targeted. All aggressors would be specific individuals or groups, located at specific places and equipped with specific resources. In response to attacks on their clients, insurance agencies would specifically target these locations and resources for retaliation, and they would avoid any collateral damage as they would otherwise become entangled with and liable to other insurers. All of this changes fundamentally in a statist world with interstate warfare. If one state, the US, attacks another, for instance Iraq, this is not just an attack by a limited number of people, equipped with limited resources and located at a clearly identifiable place. Rather, it is an attack by all Americans and with all of their resources. Every American supposedly pays taxes to the US government and is thus de facto, whether he wishes to be or not, implicated in every government aggression. Hence, while it is obviously false to claim that every American faces an equal risk of being attacked by Iraq, low or non-existent as such a risk is, it is certainly higher in New York City than in Wichita, Kansas, for instance, every American is rendered equal with respect to his own active, if not always voluntary, participation in each of his government's aggressions. Second, just as the attacker is a state, so is the attacked, Iraq. As its US counterpart, the Iraqi government has the power to tax its population or draft it into its armed forces. As taxpayer or draftee, every Iraqi is implicated in his government's defense just as every American is drawn into the US government's attack. Thus, the war becomes a war of all Americans against all Iraqis, i.e., total war. The strategy of both the attacker and the defender state will be changed accordingly. While the attacker still must be selective regarding the targets of his attack, if for no other reason than that even taxing agencies, states, are ultimately constrained by scarcity, the aggressor has little or no incentive to avoid or minimize collateral damage. To the contrary, since the entire population and national wealth is involved in the defensive effort, collateral damage, whether of lives or property, is even desirable. No clear distinction between combatants and non-combatants exists. Everyone is an enemy and all property provides support for the attacked government. Hence, everyone and everything becomes fair game. Likewise, the defender state will be little concerned about collateral damage resulting from its own retaliation against the attacker. 
Every citizen of the attacker state and all of their property is a foe and enemy property and thus becomes a possible target of retaliation. Moreover, every state, in accordance with this character of interstate war, will develop and employ more weapons of mass destruction, such as atomic bombs, rather than long-range precision weapons, such as one might imagine, laser gun. Thus, the similarity between war and natural catastrophes their seemingly indiscriminate destruction and devastation is exclusively a feature of a statist world. 8. This brings on the last problem. We have seen that just as all property is private, so is and must all defense be insured individually by capitalized insurance agencies, very much like industrial accident insurance. We have also seen that both forms of insurance differ in one fundamental respect. In the case of defense insurance, the location of the insured property matters. The premium per insured value will be different at different locations. Furthermore, aggressors can move around, their arsenal of weapons may change, and the entire character of aggression can alter with the presence of states. Thus, even given an initial property location, the price per insured value can alter with changes in the social environment or surroundings of this location. How would a system of competitive insurance agencies respond to this challenge? In particular, how would it deal with the existence of states and state aggression? In answering these questions it is essential to recall some elementary economic insights. Other things being equal, private property owners generally and business owners in particular prefer locations with low protection costs, insurance premiums, and rising property values to those with high protection costs and falling property values. Consequently, there is a tendency toward the migration of people and goods from high risk and falling property value areas into low risk and increasing property value areas. Furthermore, protection costs and property values are directly related. Other things being equal, higher protection costs, greater attack risks, imply lower or falling property values, and lower protection costs imply higher or increasing property values. These laws and tendencies shape the operation of a competitive system of insurance protection agencies. Whereas a tax-funded monopolist will manifest a tendency to raise the cost and price of protection, private profit-loss insurance agencies strive to reduce the cost of protection and thus bring about falling prices. At the same time insurance agencies are more interested than anyone else in rising property values because this implies not only that their own property holdings appreciate but that there will also be more of other people's property for them to insure. In contrast, if the risk of aggression increases and property values fall, there is less value to be insured while the cost of protection and price of insurance rises, implying poor business conditions for an insurer. Consequently, insurance companies would be under permanent economic pressure to promote the former favorable and avert the latter unfavorable condition. This incentive structure has a fundamental impact on the operation of insurers. First, as for the seemingly easier case of the protection against common crime and criminals, a system of competitive insurers would lead to a dramatic change in current crime policy. To recognize the extent of this change, it is instructive to look first at the present and familiar statist crime policy. While it is in the interest of state agents to combat common private crime, if only so that there is more property left for them to tax, as tax-funded agents they have little or no interest in being particularly effective at the task of preventing it, or if it has occurred, at compensating its victims and apprehending and punishing the offenders. Moreover, under democratic conditions, insult will be added to injury, for if everyone, aggressors as well as non-aggressors and residents of high crime locations as well as those of low crime locations, can vote and be elected to government office, a systematic redistribution of property rights from non-aggressors to aggressors and the residents of low crime areas to those of high crime areas comes into effect and crime will actually be promoted. Accordingly, crime and the demand for private security services of all kinds are currently at an all-time high. Even more scandalously, instead of compensating the victims of crimes it did not prevent, as it should have, the government forces victims to pay again as taxpayers for the cost of the apprehension, imprisonment, rehabilitation, and or entertainment of their aggressors. And rather than requiring higher protection prices in high crime locations and lower ones in low crime locations, as insurers would, the government does the exact opposite. It taxes more in low crime and high property value areas than in high crime and low property value ones, or it even subsidizes the residents of the latter locations, the slums, at the expense of those of the former, eroding the social conditions unfavorable to crime while promoting those favorable to it. The operation of competitive insurers would present a striking contrast. For one, if an insurer could not prevent a crime, it would have to indemnify the victim. 
Thus, above all insurers would want to be effective in crime prevention. If they still could not prevent it, they would want to be efficient in the detection, apprehension, and punishment of criminal offenders because in finding and arresting an offender, the insurer could force the criminal rather than the victim and its insurer to pay for the damages and cost of indemnification. More specifically, just as insurance companies currently maintain and continually update a detailed local inventory of property values, so would they maintain and continually update a detailed local inventory of crimes and criminals. Other things being equal, the risk of aggression against any private property location increases with the proximity and the number and resources of potential aggressors. Thus, insurers would be interested in gathering information on actual crimes and known criminals and their locations and it would be in their mutual interest of minimizing property damage to share this information with each other, just as banks now share information on bad credit risks with each other. Furthermore, insurers would also be particularly interested in gathering information on potential not yet committed and known crimes and aggressors and this would lead to a fundamental overhaul of and improvement in current, statist, crime statistics. In order to predict the future incidence of crime and thus calculate its current price, premium, insurers would correlate the frequency, description, and character of crimes and criminals with the social surroundings in which they occur and operate. And always under competitive pressure, they would develop and continually refine an elaborate system of demographic and sociological crime indicators. That is, every neighborhood would be described and its risk assessed in terms of a multitude of crime indicators, such as the composition of its inhabitants' sexes, age groups, races, nationalities, ethnicities, religions, languages, professions, and incomes. Consequently, and in distinct contrast to the present situation, all interlocal, regional, racial, national, ethnic, religious, and linguistic income and wealth redistribution would disappear, and a constant source of social conflict would be removed permanently. Instead, the emerging price, premium, structure would tend to accurately reflect the risk of each location and its particular social surrounding such that one would only be asked to pay for the insurance risk of himself and of that associated with his particular neighborhood. More importantly, based on its continually updated and refined system of statistics on crime and property values and further motivated by the noted migration tendency from high-risk low-value, henceforth bad to low-risk high-value, henceforth good locations, a system of competitive aggression insurers would promote a tendency towards civilizational progress rather than decivilization. Governments and democratic governments in particular erode good and promote bad neighborhoods through their tax and transfer policy. They do so also, and with possibly an even more damaging effect, through their policy of forced integration. This policy has two aspects. On the one hand, for the owners and residents in good locations and neighborhoods who are faced with an immigration problem, forced integration means that they must accept, without discrimination, every domestic immigrant, as transient or tourist on public roads, as customer, client, resident, or neighbor. They are prohibited by their government from excluding anyone, including anyone they consider an undesirable potential risk, from immigration. On the other hand, for the owners and residents in bad locations and neighborhoods who experience emigration rather than immigration, forced integration means that they are prevented from effective self-protection. Rather than being allowed to rid themselves of crime through the expulsion of known criminals from their neighborhood, they are forced by their government to live in permanent association with their aggressors. The results of a system of private protection insurers would be in striking contrast to these only all too familiar decivilizing effects and tendencies of statist crime protection. To be sure, insurers would be unable to eliminate the differences between good and bad neighborhoods. In fact, these differences might even become more pronounced. However, driven by their interest in rising property values and falling protection costs, insurers would promote a tendency to improve by uplifting and cultivating both good and bad neighborhoods. Thus, in good neighborhoods insurers would adopt a policy of selective immigration. Unlike states, they could and would not want to disregard the discriminating inclinations among the insured toward immigrants. To the contrary, even more so than any one of their clients, insurers would be interested in discrimination, i.e., in admitting only those immigrants whose presence adds to a lower crime risk and increased property values and in excluding those whose presence leads to a higher risk and lower property values. That is, rather than eliminating discrimination, insurers would rationalize and perfect its practice. 
based on their statistics on crime and property values, and in order to reduce the cost of protection and raise property values, insurers would formulate and continually refine various restrictive, exclusionary rules and procedures relating to immigration and immigrants and thus give quantitative precision in the form of prices and price differences to the value of discrimination and the cost of non-discrimination between potential immigrants as high or low risk and value productive. Similarly, in bad neighborhoods the interests of the insurers and the insured would coincide. Insurers would not want to suppress the expulsionist inclinations among the insured toward known criminals. They would rationalize such tendencies by offering selective price cuts contingent on specific cleanup operations. Indeed, in cooperation with one another, insurers would want to expel known criminals not just from their immediate neighborhood but from civilization altogether, into the wilderness or open frontier of the Amazon jungle, the Sahara, or the polar regions. 9. What about defense against a state? How would insurers protect us from state aggression? First off, it is essential to remember that governments as compulsory, tax-funded monopolies are inherently wasteful and inefficient in whatever they do. This is also true for weapons technology and production and military intelligence and strategy, especially in our age of high technology. Accordingly, states would not be able to compete within the same territory against voluntarily financed insurance agencies. Moreover, most important and general among the restrictive rules relating to immigration and designed by insurers to lower protection cost and increase property values would be a rule concerning government agents. States are inherently aggressive and pose a permanent danger to every insurer and insured. Thus, insurers in particular would want to exclude or severely restrict, as a potential security risk, the immigration, territorial entry of all known government agents, and they would induce the insured, either as a condition of insurance or of a lower premium, to exclude or strictly limit any direct contact with any known government agent, be it as visitor, customer, client, resident, or neighbor. That is, wherever insurance companies operated in all free territories, state agents would be treated as undesirable outcasts, potentially more dangerous than any common criminal. Accordingly, states and their personnel would be able to operate and reside only in territorial separation from and on the fringes of free territories. Furthermore, owing to the comparatively lower economic productivity of status territories, governments would be continually weakened by the emigration of their most value productive residents. Now, what if such a government should decide to attack or invade a free territory? This would be easier said than done. Who and what would it attack? There would be no state opponent. Only private property owners and their private insurance agencies would exist. No one, least of all the insurers, would have presumably engaged in aggression or even provocation. If there were any aggression or provocation against the state at all, this would be the action of a particular person, and in this case the interest of the state and insurance agencies would fully coincide. Both would want to see the attacker punished and held accountable for all damages. But without any aggressive enemy, how could the state justify an attack not to mention an indiscriminate attack? And surely it would have to justify it, for the power of every government, even the most despotic one, ultimately rests on opinion and consent, as La Bautai, Hume, Mises, and Rothbard have explained. Kings and presidents can issue an order to attack, of course, but there must be scores of men willing to execute their order to put it into effect. There must be generals receiving and following the order, soldiers willing to march, kill, and be killed, and domestic producers willing to continue producing to fund the war. If this consensual willingness were absent because the orders of the state rulers were considered illegitimate, even the seemingly most powerful government would be rendered ineffectual and collapse, as the recent examples of the Shah of Iran and the Soviet Union have illustrated. Hence, from the viewpoint of the leaders of the state an attack on free territories would be considered extremely risky. No propaganda effort, however elaborate, would make the public believe that its attack was anything but an aggression against innocent victims. In this situation, the rulers of the state would be happy to maintain monopolistic control over their present territory rather than run the risk of losing legitimacy and all of their power in an attempt at territorial expansion. As unlikely as this may be, what if a state still attacked and or invaded a neighboring free territory? In this case the aggressor would not encounter an unarmed population. Only in status territories is the civilian population characteristically unarmed. States everywhere aim to disarm their own citizenry so as to be better able to tax and expropriate it. In contrast, insurers in free territories would not want to disarm the insured. Nor could they. 
For who would want to be protected by someone who required him as a first step to give up his ultimate means of self-defense? To the contrary, insurance agencies would encourage the ownership of weapons among their insured by means of selective price cuts. In addition to the opposition of an armed private citizenry, the aggressor state would run into the resistance of not only one but in all likelihood several insurance and reinsurance agencies. In the case of a successful attack and invasion, these insurers would be faced with massive indemnification payments. Unlike the aggressing state, however, these insurers would be efficient and competitive firms. Other things being equal, the risk of an attack, and hence the price of defence insurance, would be higher in locations in close proximity to state territories than in places far away from any state. To justify this higher price, insurers would have to demonstrate defensive readiness vis-a-vis -vis any possible state aggression to their clients in the form of intelligence services, the ownership of suitable weapons and materials, and military personnel and training. In other words, the insurers would be effectively equipped and trained for the contingency of a state attack and ready to respond with a twofold defense strategy. On the one hand, insofar as their operations in free territories are concerned, insurers would be ready to expel, capture, or kill every invader while trying to avoid or minimize all collateral damage. On the other hand, insofar as their operations on state territory are concerned, insurers would be prepared to target the aggressor, the state, for retaliation. That is, insurers would be ready to counterattack and kill, whether with long-range precision weapons or assassination commandos, state agents from the top of the government hierarchy of king, president, or prime minister on downward while seeking to avoid or minimize all collateral damage to the property of innocent civilians, non-state agents. They would thereby encourage internal resistance against the aggressor government, promote its delegitimization, and possibly incite the liberation and transformation of the state territory into a free country. X. I have come full circle with my argument. First, I have shown that the idea of a protective state and state protection of private property is based on a fundamental theoretical error and that this error has had disastrous consequences, the destruction and insecurity of all private property and perpetual war. Second, I have shown that the correct answer to the question of who is to defend private property owners from aggression is the same as for the production of every other good or service, private property owners, cooperation based on the division of labor, and market competition. Third, I have explained how a system of private profit loss insurers would effectively minimize aggression, whether by private criminals or states, and promote a tendency towards civilization and perpetual peace. The only task outstanding is to implement these insights, to withdraw one's consent and willing cooperation from the state and to promote its delegitimization in public opinion so as to persuade others to do the same. Without the erroneous public perception and judgment of the state as just and necessary, and without the public's voluntary cooperation, even the seemingly most powerful government would implode and its powers evaporate. Thus liberated, we would regain our right to self-defense and be able to turn to freed and unregulated insurance agencies for efficient professional assistance in all matters of protection and conflict resolution. 13. On the impossibility of limited government and the prospect for revolution. In a recent survey, people of different nationalities were asked how proud they were to be American, German, French, etc., and whether or not they believed that the world would be a better place if other countries were just like their own. The countries ranking highest in terms of national pride were the United States and Austria. As interesting as it would be to consider the case of Austria, here I shall concentrate on the US and the question whether and to what extent the American claim can be justified. In the following, I will identify three main sources of American national pride. I will argue that the first two are justified sources of pride, while the third actually represents a fateful error. Finally, I will go on to explain how this error might be repaired. I. The first source of national pride is the memory of America's not so distant colonial past as a country of pioneers. In fact, the English settlers coming to North America were the last example of the glorious achievements of what Adam Smith referred to as a system of natural liberty, the ability of men to create a free and prosperous commonwealth from scratch. Contrary to the Hobbesian account of human nature, homo homini lupusist, the English settlers demonstrated not just the viability but also the vibrancy and attractiveness of a stateless, anarcho-capitalist social order. They demonstrated how, in accordance with the views of John Locke, private property originated naturally through a person's original appropriation, his purposeful use and transformation, of previously unused land, wilderness. 
Furthermore, they demonstrated that, based on the recognition of private property, division of labor, and contractual exchange, men were capable of protecting themselves effectively against antisocial aggressors, first and foremost by means of self-defense, less crime existed then than exists now, and as society grew increasingly prosperous and complex, by means of specialization, i.e., by institutions and agencies such as property registries, notaries, lawyers, judges, courts, juries, sheriffs, mutual defense associations, and popular militias. Moreover, the American colonists demonstrated the fundamental sociological importance of the institution of covenants, of associations of linguistically, ethnically, religiously, and culturally homogeneous settlers led by and subject to the internal jurisdiction of a popular leader founder to ensure peaceful human cooperation and maintain law and order. I. I. The second source of national pride is the American Revolution. In Europe there had been no open frontiers for centuries and the intra-European colonization experience lay in the distant past. With the growth of the population, societies had assumed an increasingly hierarchical structure of free men, freeholders and servants, lords and vassals, overlords and kings. While distinctly more stratified and aristocratic than colonial America, the so-called feudal societies of medieval Europe were also typically stateless social orders. A state, in accordance with generally accepted terminology, is defined as a compulsory territorial monopolist of law and order, an ultimate decision-maker. Feudal lords and kings did not typically fulfill the requirements of a state, they could only tax with the consent of the taxed, and on his own land every free man was as much a sovereign, ultimate decision-maker, as the feudal king was on his. However, in the course of many centuries these originally stateless societies had gradually transformed into absolute, statist monarchies. While they had initially been acknowledged voluntarily as protectors and judges, European kings had at long last succeeded in establishing themselves as hereditary heads of state. Resisted by the aristocracy but helped along by the common people, they had become absolute monarchs with the power to tax without consent and to make ultimate decisions regarding the property of free men. These European developments had a twofold effect on America. On the one hand, England was also ruled by an absolute king, at least until 1688, and when the English settlers arrived on the new continent, the king's rule was extended to America. Unlike the settlers' founding of private property and their private, voluntary, and cooperative production of security and administration of justice, however, the establishment of the royal colonies and administrations was not the result of original appropriation, homesteading, and contract. In fact, no English king had ever set foot on the American continent but of usurpation, declaration, and imposition. On the other hand, the settlers brought something else with them from Europe. There, the development from feudalism to royal absolutism had not only been resisted by the aristocracy but it was also opposed theoretically with recourse to the theory of natural rights as it originated within scholastic philosophy. According to this doctrine, government was supposed to be contractual, and every government agent, including the king, was subject to the same universal rights and laws as everyone else. While this may have been the case in earlier times, it was certainly no longer true for modern absolute kings. Absolute kings were usurpers of human rights and thus illegitimate. Hence, insurrection was not only permitted but became a duty sanctioned by natural law. The American colonists were familiar with the doctrine of natural rights. In fact, in light of their own personal experience with the achievements and effects of natural liberty and as religious dissenters who had left their mother country in disagreement with the king and the Church of England, they were particularly receptive to this doctrine. Steeped in the doctrine of natural rights, encouraged by the distance of the English king, and stimulated further by the puritanical censure of royal idleness, luxury and pomp, the American colonists rose up to free themselves of British rule. As Thomas Jefferson wrote in the Declaration of Independence, government was instituted to protect life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It drew its legitimacy from the consent of the governed. In contrast, the royal British government claimed that it could tax the colonists without their consent. If a government failed to do what it was designed to do, Jefferson declared, it is the right of the people to alter or abolish it and to institute new government, laying its foundation on such principles and organizing its powers in such form as to them shall seem most likely to affect their safety and happiness. I, I, I. But what was the next step once independence from Britain had been won? This question leads to the third source of national pride, the American Constitution, and the explanation as to why this Constitution, rather than being a legitimate source of pride, represents a fateful error. 
thanks to the great advances in economic and political theory since the late 1700s, in particular at the hands of Ludwig von Mises and Marianne Rothbard, we are now able to give a precise answer to this question. According to Mises and Rothbard, once there is no longer free entry into the business of the production of protection and adjudication, the price of protection and justice will rise and their quality will fall. Rather than being a protector and judge, a compulsory monopolist will become a protection racketeer, the destroyer and invader of the people and property that he is supposed to protect, a warmonger and an imperialist. Indeed, the inflated price of protection and the perversion of the ancient law by the English king, both of which had led the American colonists to revolt, were the inevitable result of compulsory monopoly. Having successfully seceded and thrown out the British occupiers, it would only have been necessary for the American colonists to let the existing homegrown institutions of self-defense and private, voluntary and cooperative, protection and adjudication by specialized agents and agencies take care of law and order. This did not happen, however. The Americans not only did not let the inherited royal institutions of colonies and colonial governments wither away into oblivion, they reconstituted them within the old political borders in the form of independent states, each equipped with its own coercive, unilateral, taxing and legislative powers. While this would have been bad enough, the new Americans made matters worse by adopting the American Constitution and replacing a loose confederation of independent states with the central, federal, government of the United States. This constitution provided for the substitution of a popularly elected parliament and president for an unelected king, but it changed nothing regarding their power to tax and legislate. To the contrary, while the English king's power to tax without consent had only been assumed rather than explicitly granted and was thus in dispute, the constitution explicitly granted this very power to Congress. Furthermore, while kings, in theory even absolute kings, had not been considered the makers but only the interpreters and executors of pre-existing and immutable law, i.e., as judges rather than legislators, the Constitution explicitly vested Congress with the power of legislating, and the President and the Supreme Court with the power of executing and interpreting such legislated law. In effect, what the American Constitution did was only this, instead of a king who regarded colonial America as his private property and the colonists as his tenants, the Constitution put temporary and interchangeable caretakers in charge of the country's monopoly of justice and protection. These caretakers did not own the country, but as long as they were in office, they could make use of it and its residents to their own and their protégés advantage. However, as elementary economic theory predicts, this institutional setup will not eliminate the self-interest-driven tendency of a monopolist of law and order towards increased exploitation. To the contrary, it only tends to make his exploitation less calculating, more short-sighted, and wasteful. As Rothbard explained, while a private owner, secure in his property and owning its capital value, plans the use of his resource over a long period of time, the government official must milk the property as quickly as he can, since he has no security of ownership. Government officials own the use of resources but not their capital value, except in the case of the private property of a hereditary monarch. When only the current use can be owned, but not the resource itself, there will quickly ensue uneconomic exhaustion of the resources, since it will be to no one's benefit to conserve it over a period of time and to every owner's advantage to use it up as quickly as possible. The private individual, secure in his property and in his capital resource, can take the long view, for he wants to maintain the capital value of his resource. It is the government official who must take and run, who must plunder the property while he is still in command. Moreover, because the Constitution provided explicitly for open entry into state government, anyone could become a member of Congress, President, or a Supreme Court judge, resistance against state property invasions declined, and as the result of open political competition, the entire character structure of society became distorted, and more and more bad characters rose to the top. For free entry and competition is not always good. Competition in the production of goods is good, but competition in the production of bads is not. Free competition in killing, stealing, counterfeiting, or swindling, for instance, is not good, it is worse than bad. Yet this is precisely what is instituted by open political competition, i.e., democracy. In every society, people who covet another man's property exist, but in most cases people learn not to act on this desire or even feel ashamed for entertaining it. In an anarcho-capitalist society in particular, anyone acting on such a desire is considered a criminal and is suppressed by physical violence. Under monarchical rule, by contrast, only one person, the king, can act on his desire for another man's property, and it is this that makes him a potential threat. 
However, because only he can expropriate while everyone else is forbidden to do likewise, a king's every action will be regarded with utmost suspicion. Moreover, the selection of a king is by accident of his noble birth. His only characteristic qualification is his upbringing as a future king and preserver of the dynasty and its possessions. This does not assure that he will not be evil, of course. However, at the same time it does not preclude that a king might actually be a harmless dilettante or even a decent person. In distinct contrast, by freeing up entry into government, the constitution permitted anyone to openly express his desire for other men's property, indeed, owing to the constitutional guarantee of freedom of speech, everyone is protected in so doing. Moreover, everyone is permitted to act on this desire, provided that he gains entry into government, hence, under the constitution everyone becomes a potential threat. To be sure, there are people who are unaffected by the desire to enrich themselves at the expense of others and to lord it over them, that is, there are people who wish only to work, produce, and enjoy the fruits of their labor. However, if politics, the acquisition of goods by political means, taxation, and legislation is permitted, even these harmless people will be profoundly affected. In order to defend themselves against attacks on their liberty and property by those who have fewer moral scruples, even these honest, hard-working people must become political animals and spend more and more time and energy developing their political skills. Given that the characteristics and talents required for political success of good looks, sociability, oratorical power, charisma, etc., are distributed unequally among men, then those with these particular characteristics and skills will have a sound advantage in the competition for scarce resources, economic success, as compared to those without them. Worse still, given that in every society more have-nots of everything worth having exist than haves, the politically talented who have little or no inhibition against taking property and lording it over others will have a clear advantage over those with such scruples. That is, open political competition favors aggressive, hence dangerous, rather than defensive, hence harmless, political talents and will thus lead to the cultivation and perfection of the peculiar skills of demagoguery, deception, lying, opportunism, corruption, and bribery. Therefore, entrance into and success within government will become increasingly impossible for anyone hampered by moral scruples against lying and stealing. Unlike kings then, congressmen, presidents, and supreme court judges do not and cannot acquire their positions accidentally. Rather, they reach their position because of their proficiency as morally uninhibited demagogues. Moreover, even outside the orbit of government, within civil society, individuals will increasingly rise to the top of economic and financial success not on account of their productive or entrepreneurial talents or even their superior defensive political talents, but rather because of their superior skills as unscrupulous political entrepreneurs and lobbyists. Thus, the constitution virtually assures that exclusively dangerous men will rise to the pinnacle of government power and that moral behavior and ethical standards will tend to decline and deteriorate all around. Moreover, the constitutionally provided separation of powers makes no difference in this regard. Two or even three wrongs do not make a right. To the contrary, they lead to the proliferation, accumulation, reinforcement, and aggravation of error. Legislators cannot impose their will on their hapless subjects without the cooperation of the president as the head of the executive branch of government, and the president in turn will use his position and the resources at his disposal to influence legislators and legislation. And although the Supreme Court may disagree with particular acts of Congress or the president, Supreme Court judges are nominated by the president and confirmed by the Senate and remain dependent on them for funding. As an integral part of the institution of government, they have no interest in limiting but every interest in expanding the government's, and hence their own, power. IV. After more than two centuries of constitutionally limited government, the results are clear and incontrovertible. At the outset of the American experiment, the tax burden imposed on Americans was light, indeed almost negligible. Money consisted of fixed quantities of gold and silver. The definition of private property was clear and seemingly immutable, and the right to self-defense was regarded as sacrosanct. No standing army existed, and, as expressed in Washington's farewell address, a firm commitment to free trade and a non-interventionist foreign policy appeared to be in place. Two hundred years later, matters have changed dramatically. Now, year in and year out the American government expropriates more than 40% of the incomes of private producers, making even the economic burden imposed on slaves and serfs seem moderate in comparison. Gold and silver have been replaced by government-manufactured paper money, and Americans are being robbed continually through money inflation. 
The meaning of private property, once seemingly clear and fixed, has become obscure, flexible, and fluid. In fact, every detail of private life, property, trade, and contract is regulated and re-regulated by ever higher mountains of paper laws, legislation, and with increasing legislation, ever more legal uncertainty and moral hazards have been created, and lawlessness has replaced law and order. Last but not least, the commitment to free trade and non-interventionism has given way to a policy of protectionism, militarism, and imperialism. In fact, almost since its beginnings the US government has engaged in relentless aggressive expansionism and, starting with the Spanish-American War and continuing past World War I and World War II to the present, the US has become entangled in hundreds of foreign conflicts and risen to the rank of the world's foremost warmonger and imperialist power. In addition, while American citizens have become increasingly more defenseless, insecure, and impoverished, and foreigners all over the globe have become ever more threatened and bullied by U.S. military power, American presidents, members of Congress, and Supreme Court judges have become ever more arrogant, morally corrupt, and dangerous. See also Anthony de Gisse, Against Politics, On Government, Anarchy, and Order, London, Routledge, 1997, especially Chapter 2. What can possibly be done about this state of affairs? First, the American Constitution must be recognized for what it is an error. As the Declaration of Independence noted, government is supposed to protect life, property, and the pursuit of happiness. Yet in granting government the power to tax and legislate without consent, the Constitution cannot possibly assure this goal but is instead the very instrument for invading and destroying the rights to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. It is absurd to believe that an agency which may tax without consent can be a property protector. Likewise, it is absurd to believe that an agency with legislative powers can preserve law and order. Rather, it must be recognized that the Constitution is itself unconstitutional, i.e., incompatible with the very doctrine of natural human rights that inspired the American Revolution. Indeed, no one in his right mind would agree to a contract that allowed one's alleged protector to determine unilaterally, without one's consent, and irrevocably, without the possibility of exit, how much to charge for protection, and no one in his right mind would agree to an irrevocable contract which granted one's alleged protector the right to ultimate decision-making regarding one's own person and property, i.e., of unilateral lawmaking. Second, it is necessary to offer a positive and inspiring alternative to the present system. While it is important that the memory of America's past as a land of pioneers and an effective anarcho-capitalist system based on self-defense and popular militias be kept alive, we cannot return to the feudal past or the time of the American Revolution. Yet the situation is not hopeless. Despite the relentless growth of statism over the course of the past two centuries, economic development has continued and our living standards have reached spectacular new heights. Under these circumstances a completely new option has become viable, the provision of law and order by freely competing private, profit and loss insurance agencies. While hampered by the state, even now insurance agencies protect private property owners upon payment of a premium against a multitude of natural and social disasters, from floods and hurricanes to theft and fraud. Thus, it would seem that the production of security and protection is the very purpose of insurance. Moreover, people would not turn to just anyone for a service as essential as that of protection. Rather, as de Molinari noted, before striking a bargain with a producer of security, they will check if he is really strong enough to protect them and whether his character is such that they will not have to worry about his instigating the very aggressions he is supposed to suppress. In this regard insurance agencies also seem to fit the bill. They are big and in command of the resources, physical and human, necessary to accomplish the task of dealing with the dangers, actual or imagined, of the real world. Indeed, insurers operate on a national or even international scale, and they own substantial property holdings dispersed over wide territories and beyond the borders of single states and thus have a manifest self-interest in effective protection. Furthermore, all insurance companies are connected through a complex network of contractual agreements on mutual assistance and arbitration as well as a system of international reinsurance agencies representing a combined economic power which dwarfs most if not all contemporary governments, and they have acquired this position because of their reputation as effective, reliable, and honest businesses. While this may suffice to establish insurance agencies as a possible alternative to the role currently performed by states as providers of law and order, a more detailed examination is needed to demonstrate the principal superiority of such an alternative to the status quo.
In order to do this, it is only necessary to recognize that insurance agencies can neither tax nor legislate, that is, the relationship between the insurer and the insured is consensual. Both are free to cooperate or not to cooperate, and this fact has momentous implications. In this regard, insurance agencies are categorically different from states. The advantages of having insurance agencies provide security and protection are as follows. First off, competition among insurers for paying clients will bring about a tendency toward a continuous fall in the price of protection per insured value, thus rendering protection more affordable. In contrast, a monopolistic protector who may tax the protected will charge ever higher prices for his services. Second, insurers will have to indemnify their clients in the case of actual damage, hence, they must operate efficiently. Regarding social disasters, crime in particular, this means that the insurer must be concerned above all with effective prevention, for unless he can prevent a crime, he will have to pay up. Further, if a criminal act cannot be prevented, an insurer will still want to recover the loot, apprehend the offender, and bring him to justice, because in so doing the insurer can reduce his costs and force the criminal, rather than the victim and his insurer, to pay for the damages and cost of indemnification. In distinct contrast, because compulsory monopolist states do not indemnify victims and because they can resort to taxation as a source of funding, they have little or no incentive to prevent crime or to recover loot and capture criminals. If they do manage to apprehend a criminal, they typically force the victim to pay for the criminal's incarceration, thus adding insult to injury. Third and most importantly, because the relationship between insurers and their clients is voluntary, insurers must accept private property as an ultimate, given, and private property rights as immutable law. That is, in order to attract or retain paying clients, insurers will have to offer contracts with specified property and property damage descriptions, rules of procedure, evidence, compensation, restitution, and punishment as well as intra- and interagency conflict resolution and arbitration procedures. Moreover, out of the steady cooperation between different insurers in mutual interagency arbitration proceedings, a tendency toward the unification of law, of a truly universal or international law, will emerge. Everyone, by virtue of being insured, would thus become tied into a global competitive effort to minimize conflict and aggression, and every single conflict and damage claim, regardless of where and by or against whom, would fall into the jurisdiction of exactly one or more specific and innumerable insurance agencies and their contractual agreed to arbitration procedures, thereby creating perfect legal certainty. In striking contrast, as tax-funded monopoly protectors states do not offer the consumers of protection anything even faintly resembling a service contract. Instead, they operate in a contractual void that allows them to make up and change the rules of the game as they go along. Most remarkably, whereas insurers must submit themselves to independent third-party arbitrators and arbitration proceedings in order to attract voluntary paying clients, states, insofar as they allow for arbitration at all, assign this task to another state-funded and state-dependent judge. Further implications of this fundamental contrast between insurers as contractual versus states as non-contractual providers of security deserve special attention. Because they are not subject to and bound by contracts, states typically outlaw the ownership of weapons by their clients, thus increasing their own security at the expense of rendering their alleged clients defenseless. In contrast, no voluntary buyer of protection insurance would agree to a contract that required him to surrender his right to self-defense and be unarmed or otherwise defenseless. To the contrary, insurance agencies would encourage the ownership of guns and other protective devices among their clients by means of selective price cuts, because the better the private protection of their clients, the lower the insurer's protection and indemnification costs will be. Moreover, because they operate in a contractual void and are independent of voluntary payment, states arbitrarily define and redefine what is and what is not a punishable aggression and what does and does not require compensation. By imposing a proportional or progressive income tax and redistributing income from the rich to the poor, for instance, states in effect define the rich as aggressors and the poor as their victims. Otherwise, if the rich were not aggressors and the poor not their victims, how could taking something from the former and giving it to the latter be justified? Or by passing affirmative action laws, states effectively define whites and males as aggressors and blacks and women as their victims. For insurance agencies, any such business conduct would be impossible for two fundamental reasons. First, every insurance involves the pooling of particular risks into risk classes. It implies that to some of the insured more will be paid out than what they paid in, and to others less. However, and this is decisive, no one knows in advance who the winners and who the losers will be. 
winners and losers and any income redistribution among them will be randomly distributed. Otherwise, if winners and losers could be systematically predicted, losers would not want to pull their risk with winners but only with other losers because this would lower their insurance premium. Second, it is not possible to insure oneself against any conceivable risk. Rather, it is only possible to insure oneself against accidents, i.e., risks over whose outcome the insured has no control whatsoever and to which he contributes nothing. Thus, it is possible to insure oneself against the risk of death or fire, for instance, but it is not possible to insure oneself against the risk of committing suicide or setting one's own house on fire. Similarly, it is impossible to insure oneself against the risk of business failure, of unemployment, of not becoming rich, of not feeling like getting up and out of bed in the morning, or of disliking one's neighbors, fellows or superiors, because in each of these cases one has either full or partial control over the event in question. That is, an individual can affect the likelihood of the risk. By their very nature, the avoidance of risks such as these falls into the realm of individual responsibility, and any agency that undertook their insurance would be slated for immediate bankruptcy. Most significantly for the subject under discussion, the uninsurability of individual actions and sentiments in contradistinction to accidents implies that it is also impossible to insure oneself against the risk of damages which are the result of one's prior aggression or provocation. Rather, every insurer must restrict the actions of its clients so as to exclude all aggression and provocation on their part. That is, any insurance against social disasters such as crime must be contingent on the insured submitting themselves to specified norms of non-aggressive, civilized conduct. Accordingly, while states as monopolistic protectors can engage in redistributive policies benefiting one group of people at the expense of another, and while as tax-supported agencies they can even insure an insurable risks and protect provocateurs and aggressors, voluntarily funded insurers would be systematically prevented from doing any such thing. Competition among insurers would preclude any form of income and wealth redistribution among various groups of insured, for a company engaging in such practices would lose clients to others refraining from them. Rather, every client would pay exclusively for his own risk, respectively that of people with the same, homogeneous risk exposure as he faces. Nor would voluntarily funded insurers be able to protect any person from the consequences of his own erroneous, foolish, risky, or aggressive conduct or sentiment. Competition between insurers would instead systematically encourage individual responsibility, and any known provocateur and aggressor would be excluded as a bad insurance risk from any insurance coverage whatsoever and be rendered an economically isolated, weak, and vulnerable outcast. Finally, with regard to foreign relations, because states can externalize the costs of their own actions onto hapless taxpayers, they are permanently prone to becoming aggressors and warmongers. Accordingly, they tend to fund and develop weapons of aggression and mass destruction. In distinct contrast, insurers will be prevented from engaging in any form of external aggression because any aggression is costly and requires higher insurance premiums, implying the loss of clients to other, non-aggressive competitors. Insurers will engage exclusively in defensive violence and instead of acquiring weapons of aggression and mass destruction, they will tend to invest in the development of weapons of defense and of targeted retaliation. V. Even though all of this is clear, how can we ever succeed in implementing such a fundamental constitutional reform? Insurance agencies are presently restricted by countless regulations which prevent them from doing what they could and naturally would do. How can they be freed from these regulations? Essentially, the answer to this question is the same as that given by the American revolutionaries more than 200 years ago through the creation of free territories and by means of secession. In fact today under democratic conditions this answer is even truer than it was in the days of kings. For then, under monarchical conditions, the advocates of an antistatist liberal libertarian social revolution still had an option that has since been lost. Liberal libertarians in the old days could, and frequently did, believe in the possibility of simply converting the king to their view, thereby initiating a revolution from the top. No mass support was necessary for this, just the insight of an enlightened prince. However realistic this might have been then, today this top-down strategy of social revolution would be impossible. Not only are political leaders selected nowadays according to their demagogic talents and proven record as habitual moralists, as has been explained above, consequently, the chance of converting them to liberal libertarian views must be considered even lower than that of converting a king who simply inherited his position. 
Moreover, the state's protection monopoly is now considered public rather than private property, and government rule is no longer tied to a particular individual but to specified functions exercised by anonymous functionaries. Hence, the one or few men conversion strategy can no longer work. It does not matter if one converts a few top government officials, the president and some leading senators or judges, for instance, because within the rules of democratic government no single individual has the power to abdicate the government's monopoly of protection. Kings had this power, but presidents do not. The president can resign from his position, of course, only to have it taken over by someone else. He cannot dissolve the governmental protection monopoly because according to the rules of democracy, the people, not their elected representatives, are considered the owners of government. Thus, rather than by means of a top-down reform, under the current conditions one strategy must be one of a bottom-up revolution. At first, the realization of this insight would seem to make the task of a liberal libertarian social revolution impossible. For does this not imply that one would have to persuade a majority of the public to vote for the abolition of democracy and an end to all taxes and legislation? And is this not sheer fantasy, given that the masses are always dull and indolent, and even more so given that democracy, as explained above, promotes moral and intellectual degeneration? How in the world can anyone expect that a majority of an increasingly degenerate people accustomed to the right to vote should ever voluntarily renounce the opportunity of looting other people's property? Put this way, one must admit that the prospect of a social revolution must indeed be regarded as virtually nil. Rather, it is only on second thought, upon regarding secession as an integral part of any bottom-up strategy, that the task of a liberal libertarian revolution appears less than impossible, even if it still remains a daunting one. How does secession fit into a bottom-up strategy of social revolution? More importantly, how can a secessionist movement escape the Southern Confederacy's fate of being crushed by a tyrannical and dangerously uncentral government? In response to these questions it is first necessary to remember that neither the original American Revolution nor the American Constitution were the result of the will of the majority of the population. A third of the American colonists were actually Tories, and another third was occupied with daily routines and did not care either way. No more than a third of the colonists were actually committed to and supportive of the revolution, yet they carried the day. And as far as the Constitution is concerned, the overwhelming majority of the American public was opposed to its adoption, and its ratification represented more of a coup d'etat by a tiny minority than the general will. All revolutions, whether good or bad, are started by minorities, and the secessionist route toward social revolution, which necessarily involves the breaking away of a smaller number of people from a larger one, takes explicit cognizance of this important fact. Second, it is necessary to recognize that the ultimate power of every government, whether of kings or caretakers, rests solely on opinion and not on physical force. The agents of government are never more than a small proportion of the total population under their control. This implies that no government can possibly enforce its will upon the entire population unless it finds widespread support and voluntary cooperation within the non-governmental public. It implies likewise that every government can be brought down by a mere change in public opinion, i.e., by the withdrawal of the public's consent and cooperation. And while it is undeniably true that after more than two centuries of democracy the American public has become so degenerate, morally and intellectually, that any such withdrawal must be considered impossible on a nationwide scale, it would not seem insurmountably difficult to win a secessionist-minded majority in sufficiently small districts or regions of the country. In fact, given an energetic minority of intellectual elites inspired by the vision of a free society in which law and order is provided by competitive insurers, and given furthermore that, certainly in the US, which owes its very existence to a secessionist act, secession is still held to be legitimate and in accordance with the original, democratic ideal of self-determination, rather than majority rule, by a substantial number of people, there seems to be nothing unrealistic about assuming that such secessionist majorities exist or can be created at hundreds of locations all over the country. In fact, under the rather realistic assumption that the US central government as well as the social democratic states of the West in general are bound for economic bankruptcy, much like the socialist people's democracies of the East collapsed economically some 10 years ago, present tendencies toward political disintegration will likely be strengthened in the future. Accordingly, the number of potential secessionist regions will continue to rise, even beyond its current level. Finally, the insight into the widespread and growing secessionist potential also permits an answer to the last question regarding the dangers of a central government crackdown. 
While it is important in this regard that the memory of the secessionist past of the U.S. be kept alive, it is even more important for the success of a liberal libertarian revolution to avoid the mistakes of the second failed attempt at secession. Fortunately, the issue of slavery, which complicated and obscured the situation in 1861, has been resolved. However, another important lesson must be learned by comparing the failed second American experiment with secession to the successful first one. The first American secession was facilitated significantly by the fact that at the center of power in Britain, public opinion concerning the secessionists was hardly unified. In fact, many prominent British figures such as Edmund Burke and Adam Smith, for instance, openly sympathized with the secessionists. Apart from purely ideological reasons, which rarely affect more than a handful of philosophical minds, this lack of a unified opposition to the American secessionists in British public opinion can be attributed to two complementary factors. On the one hand, a multitude of regional and cultural religious affiliations as well as of personal and family ties between Britain and the American colonists existed. On the other hand, the American events were considered far from home and the potential loss of the colonies as economically insignificant. In both regards, the situation in 1861 was distinctly different. To be sure, at the center of political power, which had shifted to the northern states of the U.S. by then, opposition to the secessionist Southern Confederacy was not unified, and the Confederate cause also had supporters in the North. However, fewer cultural bonds and kinship ties existed between the American North and South than had existed between Britain and the American colonists, and the secession of the Southern Confederacy involved about half the territory and a third of the entire population of the U.S. and thus struck Northerners as close to home and as a significant economic loss. Therefore, it was comparatively easier for the Northern power elite to mold a unified front of progressive Yankee culture versus a culturally backward and reactionary Dixieland. In light of these considerations, then, it appears strategically advisable not to attempt again what in 1861 failed so painfully, four contiguous states or even the entire South trying to break away from the tyranny of Washington, D.C. Rather, a modern liberal libertarian strategy of secession should take its cues from the European Middle Ages when, from about the 12th until well into the 17th century, with the emergence of the modern central state, Europe was characterized by the Existence of hundreds of free and independent cities interspersed into a predominantly feudal social structure. By choosing this model and striving to create a U.S. punctuated by a large and increasing number of territorially disconnected free cities, a multitude of Hong Kongs, Singapores, Monacos, and Liechtensteins strewn out over the entire continent, two otherwise unattainable but central objectives can be accomplished. First, besides recognizing the fact that the liberal libertarian potential is distributed highly unevenly across the country, such a strategy of piecemeal withdrawal renders secession less threatening politically, socially and economically second, by pursuing this strategy simultaneously at a great number of locations all over the country, it becomes exceedingly difficult for the central state to create a unified opposition in public opinion to the secessionists which would secure the level of popular support and voluntary cooperation necessary for a successful crackdown. If and only if we succeed in this endeavor, if we then proceed to return all public property into appropriate private hands and adopt a new constitution which declares all taxation and legislation henceforth unlawful, and if we then finally allow insurance agencies to do what they are destined to do, can we truly be proud again, and will America be justified in claiming to provide an example to the rest of the world?